Thursday, December 3rd meeting of the school committee. And we start by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I will run through our agenda, which is actually rather short this evening. Um, first, we will have recognitions. Then there will be an opportunity for public comment. Then we will have reports. After that, there will be budget presentations, and then on to new business. We have no old business this evening, and then we will have items by consensus and adjournment. Um, at this time, Dr. McLeod, do we have any recognitions this evening? Yes, I have one this evening. Um, I, I really wanted to recognize, I believe it's the second year that they have done, uh, the high school has held Top of the Hill. It was the first year. Was it the first year? Because I remember... Um, wasn't it Josh's the idea? Okay, vision. All right. We've been talking about it. All right. Yes. Anyway, um, sorry. And were you there? I was out of town. Oh, because I was going to get you to help me with this because I wasn't able to I was attend. Kind of planning there you go. Um, and so the idea that Josh had, um, so Josh, one of the assistant principals at the at the high school, was to honor Hopkinton alumni. And so they had the first one um, last week. And I just wanted to read the names of the individuals that were honored. I just think it, it's really wonderful. Um, so the class of 2015 inductees were Paul Phipps, 1939, Mary Beatty Harrington, 1954, Thomas McIntyre, 1972, Denise Millard, 1992. So, sorry, these are all the years that they graduated. Megan Finley Altador from 1995, the class of 1995, and Sean Terry, 2005. They were honored. They were all there with, the, you know, some of them had graduation pictures. There's a write up here on each of them. Um, and I just think it's a wonderful idea. I was disappointed that I couldn't be there, but I did want to recognize um, that these individuals were chosen for the, the first year for the class of two, 2015. Well, and, and they also met with students during the day. Oh, nice. So they talked about their careers. So they were honored for achievement in their field or in, like, for example, Mary Harrington or Tommy McIntyre that have given so much back to the community. Nice. Um, so it really was wonderful. And it, it was Josh's brainchild. It's yeah. such a great uh, inspiration for the kids and kind of, you know, this is, this is where you can go. And uh, so it was a really nice connection. So the criteria was based on it their career? had to career. be nominated by, so other people had to nominate them. And there were, I'm trying to remember, we probably had 10 to 15 nominees. And um, and whoever was not selected will stay in the pool. And so it'll be an ongoing thing, and people can mm -hmm. continue to nominate them. But yeah, so, um, and I don't remember specifically the criteria. They need to have graduated from the high school and have made a contribution to their field or to the community. Um, so there really was a wide variety, I mm -hmm. think, Somebody is um, a social ac activist, uh, Paul Phipps and Mary Harrington, and um, Tom McIntyre, obviously really influential and contributed so much to our community. And um, so other people had substantial, uh, maybe one is an attorney. I can't remember off the top of my mm -hmm. head, but the write-ups are on there. You were there, Mike. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah. And I, and I believe you can watch the whole presentation on HCAM. On um, HCAM? Yes. Which, of I course. Will, which we are going to all go home and do tonight. Yeah. So it, it was really, I mean, kudos to Josh. And this was a collaboration with the PTA and the HEF. And, and the HEF, correct. And, yeah. Yeah, and the 300th Anniversary yeah. um, Committee. So really an exciting program. Can I add one recognition? Please, everybody I just can. wanted to recognize um, the middle school drama program. They're, they're having their play. It starts tomorrow, uh, tomorrow and Saturday. And it's an original play that they wrote with Miss Gifford called It All Starts Here, and it's about the 300, uh, 300 years of Hopkinton's history and um, includes the marathon. I think it's from the perspective of a boy who moves here and is learning about the town and, um, you know, middle school boys. So I, I can't wait to go see it, and I think, you know, there's no greater and more engaging way to get kids it, it involved in the town's history. And so it's the 8th? 
eighth grade drama group, right? I think it's the whole middle school. Okay. Eighth, right? I, think it is. I know. Grade, yeah. I noted that they have somebody acting for Mrs. Be ben Benick. So one of the students oh is going to be Mrs. Ben Benick. Um, <laughs> And one is going to be Mrs. Grady. So I am oh, okay. very disappointed to, to, to miss it. But that's going to be worth the really... price of admission right yeah. here. Yeah, there's right, a few so. cameos, I understand. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's this weekend. So people Great. Turn there's out a see. lot actually going on this weekend. Yes. There's the Christmas tree lighting this weekend. Yeah. The um, HBTA is having a home Little tour thing, yeah. yep, around the town. Actually, there's um, a play with a bunch of kids from first grade through seventh grade that is the magic tree house series oh, yeah. happening on saturday at the hca and i'm trying to remember everything else oh the sky's the limit foundation is having their gingerbread house making on saturday right. morning mm -hmm. so uh, which i'm thrilled about because we had a great time there last year oh, so fun. do they do it here they do right in the cafeteria and you um pre-order your house and when you come the house is built which is Fabulous. For anyone that's done gingerbread house making, yes, the house, that's the worst. The house building is the worst. And then they give you all the supplies and the table, and you can just sit there and build and Aww. make your house and take it home. And who doesn't love doing that, right? Yeah, it's a, oh, I mean, it was fun. absolutely a great fundraising idea because then the, ma the mess is out of your house and yeah. you get to take it home. But Good. there's a lot definitely going on this weekend. <laughs> fun. Um, okay, well, I guess if there's nothing else, you know. Um, we can move on to public comment, which we have no members of the public here, so we will skip on to reports. And the first report is for um, a student council member who is yeah, also not yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll move on to Mr. Graziano with the ESBC report. Thanks. Um, not too much to update, really, just to highlight some upcoming meetings um, as we move into the design development phase for the new elementary school. Um, we actually were just informed mere hours ago that um, we have been invited um, to meet with the MSBA this coming Monday, um, the 7th at 2.30 at the MSBA offices. Um, this is a transition meeting to basically meet the new team at the MSBA we'll be working with now that we've entered uh, the design development phase. Um, they assign us a new project manager and others um, for this section of the project. Um, so we'll be doing that on Monday. And then we will be, the following week, we'll be starting our monthly meetings on design development, which will each cover um, specific relevant sections of design development. So December 14th, we're meeting as a, a full elementary school building committee um, to review the lead certification items, as well as the site design review, um, and also hear an update on the edu educational planning progress. So, and then we will have, again, one of those meetings every month through February, I guess, thus far on different topics. That's all there is today. Anybody else have any reports? And I don't have anything for um, the CPAC either. We, we haven't met since our last meeting. So. Okay. Um, and the chair report, which I, I guess there isn't <laughs> one. I have no report, um, and Ellen hasn't given me any report. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to Dr. McLeod, Superintendent. Report. So my report is really going to be the next report, which is the preliminary budget overview. Um, that has been the entire focus of the past many weeks, and so I think we can move right into that. Great. So we will move into the budget presentations, which... The first one is Dr. McLeod and Mr. Dumas with the preliminary budget overview. So, I'm sorry, can I ask yes. a procedural question? So are we expecting others because we're running about 25 minutes ahead of schedule? We and are. I'm a little so worried about Mr. Mosier yeah. um, did confirm that he would come. Um, I was looking for my phone because I was going to text him. If you, if you want, somebody could text him. Um, I don't know if Mr. Manning is coming. I know that he was invited, that, that Janine reached out to him, but that is a very good point. I guess we could do, although it's very quick, yeah, new, new business. Oh, we might as well. Um, yeah, we buy some. Do we want to move into new business and do that? Okay. We, and we could and do the could, items by consensus. Could somebody text Al to let him know because he's the only other person, um, both Schultz and Al, to be here much earlier? I'll get a Okay, thank you. Okay, so do we all agree to move into new business for the time being and move back to the budget presentation? Sure. Great. Okay, that'll be you then. 
Okay, so for new business, we have the Capital Project School Department Article Warrant 16-026 in the amount of $11,720.70. Mr. Dimas. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to reach out. It's okay. Hi. So this is requ the request um, for payment of the invoice for a capital project invoice as appropriated in Articles 22, 24, and 28. Um, specifically, Ralph? Like school safety and security oh, okay. and, like your, and outdoor court and surfacing. Okay, well, there you go. Thank you, so guys. thank you. <laughs> so that was what it was for. Um, and so you can see the recommended motion. Yeah. So the recommended motion is to move to approve the payment of the warrant 16-026 in the amount of $11,720.70 to the vendors as outlined in the warrant. Does anyone have any discussion about the motion? Any discussion or questions regarding the contents of the warrant? Okay. You guys are not helping stretch the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Would anyone like to make? Am I supposed to make the motion? Um, you you ask if anybody would like to. Uh, would anyone motion? like to make the motion as written in the agenda materials? I will move to approve the payment of warrant number 16-026 in the amount of $11,720.70 to the vendors as outlined in the agenda materials. Second. Okay. Moved by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And the, sorry, the motion is unanimously approved. Yeah. Jean, did you text John? I did. He's okay. not answering. So okay. He's so um, I could talk about that that piece, and that that is a really good idea. Do um, that items by consensus too. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Already. Would you like me to do items by consensus? <laughs> sure. Okay. There's no old business, so we're moving right along. <laughs> okay. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-025 in the amount of $385,000. $175.40. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the high school student activities warrant number 16-027 in the amount of $11,033.38. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $975 from the Sky's the Limit fundraiser to be placed in the middle school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. I know. Um, so, I'll we, we didn't vote. We so moved. There we go. Second. <laughs> I am really Motion sorry. by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous. It's okay. Carrie. So All right. A couple more minutes. How slowly can we write our names? Well, <laughs> I can talk a, a little bit about, about how we the budget process has been different this year. Um, let me talk about that a little bit, and then and that includes our missing guests. Um, who are only missing because we asked them to be here at 7.30. Um, one of the things, having gone through the process, and I know we've tried different things in terms of aligning with the, with the town side, et cetera, um, is that it became very clear to me that because I'm the only department um, that has a committee, um, that We've already gone through our budget in great detail by the time we get to the Board of Selectmen's meeting in February. I think it's usually February. Um, at which point, they, they haven't been made aware and have many questions that we've already processed or gone through. And so really felt it was important that they, be, that they feel um, included in the discussion level uh, and so that they can thoroughly understand and be aware of how thorough the school committee is in terms of all of the, the level of questioning that takes place with every single line. Um, and so we started that conversation. We started at first, John, when you were chair and continued it this year um, with Ellen, reached out to John Mosier and Brian Herr, who are our liaisons to the Board of Selectmen, and uh, they were willing to participate. Um, I felt that if they were going to be here, they should be able to do more than just sit and listen, um, and as well as appropriations. So we have done that. I know that Brian and John are going to share 
they're going to come eat every other meeting, but we do have binders, correct, um, for each of them. So even for the individual who isn't here, they will have the detailed information that they can review, and then I'm going to encourage them at that point to call us for if they have questions, at which point, obviously, I would I would be sharing them with the school committee. Um, so that people are, are really aware of, of what it is and how we, how, we, how we go through our budget process. So um, the other thing that's different is that um, we, I guess first of all I want to recognize the administrative team um, and just how hard that they've worked and seriously they've worked on this process since, since the beginning of October, which is when the budget me message went out. Um, I want to begin by, by acknowledging their hard work. Um, from the very beginning, the message was that we want, we are looking for a budget that is absolutely the necessities to maintain their programs at the level in which they are currently running, um, and that we needed to look at the, the priorities across the district, and, not, and that might mean that some buildings needed more than others. Um, they, were, they brought th that to the initial meeting, and when we finished all of that work, we were already at a percent that was beyond what we were going to be comfortable coming forward with. So we did an entire, went through it all over again. And I, I just want to thank them because it was very collaborative. Difficult decisions were made, but never decisions that would compromise a program. Um, and I was really, really impressed with the level of collaboration and understanding that people brought that it's not just my department or it's not just my building. Um, and, and then before, you know, we move forward, I just want to um, especially acknowledge Ralph and Bob um, for their leadership in, in this process. It's, it, and Deb, who isn't here, um, Bartholomew, she, who, who was, she's always just so patient, you just never see her ever show any kind of frustration. Um, I also just want to, you know, this whole process was done on Excel spreadsheets. So it was being updated like immediately. And, um, and, and kudos to, to, to Mr. Dumas because um, everybody had editing privileges. And so for a little while there. That's risky. Um, <laughs> just let them feel the power for a little bit. And then, then we Thanks to Ashok for his work behind the scenes. Absolutely. Uh, making sure that all worked. Yeah, right. set up in Google Docs and yeah. all that to work. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so we feel really prepared. We feel really um, excited, actually, about the next several weeks of being able to share what's what wh where we're at with the budget, um, and and listen to your questions and and explain any questions that you may have. Um, and so I can't put in any more filler at this point. <laughs> You don't have any song okay. or dance. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a show. Okay. So we can we can get started. He said he's on his way. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Well, he he'll have a copy of this. Yeah. And I'm sure so, he'll watch on TV. Okay. You know, I'll do the first couple slides, and then Ralph's gonna jump in and do most of it. You are. <laughs> Budget highlights. Did you want me to start? Oh yes, by all means. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> So the highlights, um, in, as we looked at the budget as a whole, once it was complete, was really being able to increase staffing to support priority initiatives. Although overall, um, we'll be talking about the, the percent increase, what we wanted to be able to do is to stay within a reasonable increase while still um, uh, increasing where it was most needed in the areas that were going to support the priority initiative. So you will see the, the addition of an, another reading coach. So there will be two reading coaches. You have heard me talking about the addition, the numbers of uh, second language learners. So you'll see additions of English language learner teachers. Um, elementary adjustment counselor is something that was a high priority at one of the buildings, and you'll be learning about that, um, and, and decisions that were made in order to be able to do that. And um, an additional BCBA, I'll be talking a lot more about that, um, as well as maintenance to um, assist with, and you'll hear from Al tonight, focus on um, the grounds maintenance. Um, secondly, the other highlight is, is really looking at 
school facilities that support effective instruction and you're going to be learning about some really exciting ideas that are going to be that are in this current budget that have been proposed for next year uh, particularly around the high school physics lab an additional lab um, and the library and um, when we get there Bob, Bob is going to talk a little bit more about that uh, a middle school engineering classroom that's going to be created and then um, just maintaining painting carpeting things that have been left off um, that haven't been for the past two years approved we really felt that these were important we want to be proud of the environment proud of our schools and maintain um, the, the buildings that we have targeted professional development we looked and have heard t our teachers talking about the fact that they want the professional development to be aligned with what it is that they're being asked to do that's new right and it's not only that we want to make sure that we're not sending people off to just one day things that that aren't really aligned with what we want them to be focusing on so if it's writing is the initiative the PD is going to support that initiative um, you'll see that in the the curriculum uh, in the central office uh, report uh, technology Ashok's going to be talking about this tonight. Um, in his budget is um, the, the ability to attract and sustain a high-functioning technology support staff in what has become a highly competitive market. And I'm going to leave that to Ashok to discuss, but it's definitely a highlight um, and, and really visionary thinking on his part um, in, in terms of how he was able to do that. Um, uh, this is a, a ongoing from last year, meeting the needs of high-needs learners. And then, as you know, a focus, which is actually using student assessment to establish high expectations. So not only um, gathering the information, but using the information that we have to, to create instructional programs that establish high expectations for students. Um, so these are the highlights that you're going to be hearing about for the next three weeks. Would you like to jump in there, Mr. Dumas? <laughs> So um, what we have in front of us right now is the enrollment projection. These are based upon um, uh, the most recent NESDEC uh, report, which is dated October 28th. Um, at the high school, uh, they are proposed are projecting uh, a slight decrease. Uh, at the middle school, a uh, slight increase. At the elementary schools, slight decrease. Preschool, an increase of, of one. Out of district special education, we currently have 27 students out of district. Uh, we're um, expecting that we'll have 25 next year. A vocational, that's Norfolk, Ag uh, Norfolk Aggie. We currently have five students. At this point, we don't have any better information, so they're all underclassmen so that we know that they'll be there next year. So um, the total enrollment projection for next, next year is 3,473 students. We're comfortable with this projection. Um, if you recall, when we had the students that moved in throughout the summer, but the net was minus three. So we're very comfortable with, with this projection based on, on what we've been seeing, even though there's a lot of development. Um, but as we go through, please jump in at any time with questions. Did, did anybody have questions about enrollment? Um, the next slide is, uh, gives you a, a little bit of a snapshot of the, what transpired during the, the reviews that we did with uh, the principals and directors and um, other department heads. Um, the original request uh, for increases totaled $2.9 million, which represented a 7.46% increase compared to this year's budget. The original request for existing staff, the cost next year for staff that we have in place right now uh, would increase by $949,000. That's due to contractual obligations um, such as uh, collective bargaining um, uh, agreements, uh, steps on the teacher scale, um, column changes for teachers, and um, it, there is an assumption that there will be a um, settlements um, that the teachers contract will be ratified as part of that and that uh, the nurses contract will at some point in time be ratified uh, and we already know what the cost of the paras is going to be next year add all that up um, 
and the number goes up $949,000, budget to budget. Okay? Uh, the new staff that was requested was uh, over a million dollars. Uh, the increase that was um, um, requested in the expense categories was $927,000. During our reviews, um, we took a haircut to all of those um, categories. The existing staff has, uh, cost for existing staff has dropped um, by $558,000. That's a reduction of um, staff who are currently in place. So now uh, the budget shows an increase for existing staff of $391,000. Uh, the new staff was reduced by 84000 and so the cost of new staff is $958,000. In the expense categories have been um, reduced by 591000 so we're now down to three hundred thirty-six. So we have a total budget increase that we're bringing to you tonight of $1,686,000, which um, uh, amounts to a 4.31%. 16 to FY17. May I ask on existing staff? Is that because of people who have said they higher? No, uh, the 949 or the, or the, the difference? The, the difference, ability right. to go The down. difference? No. Well, um, in some cases, yes. Uh, but the majority of those cases is, is uh, due to a, a reshuffling of the deck. Uh, positions changed. Uh, our positions um, were eliminated. Uh, were eliminated. For example, I think it was at grade five, mm -hmm. uh, the, the incoming grade five students. Um, and, and, and so we'll talk about yeah, that. There are, um, there were, there are fewer elementary. students at Hopkins yeah, next, yeah. next year, so yeah. we were eliminating one teacher. Okay. okay. Um, so overall, any other questions on this slide before we move on? I think the, the piece that. Um, I mentioned at the beginning was this the discussion about you know asking people first of all to bring priorities and then what what of these priorities because they all are priorities what cannot wait if you had to choose one oh please um, our guest of honor has arrived <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mosher there's Hi, a Mr. Mosher. for you yeah. and welcome fun. thanks for coming but you're stuck sitting next to me we're just doing the overview we hit you haven't missed anything um, but also what jumps out to me and what I heard over and over again in meeting with the principals and department heads was what's most important is, is staff. There are things that we can do without, but there are people that we cannot. And so some of these things can wait um, another year, but we absolutely need the people to get the work done that we need to get done. So can I ask a question? Um, I, I, I think I... I like the way this looks, but just want to make sure I'm understanding it as an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of what we've seen last year, so, sure. previous year. So um, I like the breakout of existing and new, but but if, if I compare it to what we usually see, the breakdown of of personnel and expense, yep. if I just add the 391 and the 958, that's our personnel increase overall. Okay. So Correct. And you'll see that. You're going to see it. In a couple of slides. Okay. So I don't, I don't want to labor this if we're going to get into it during other discussions but I guess I'm still not understanding with the existing staff if you have an original request that has dropped nearly six hundred thousand dollars it, it just seems like how how is that possible <laughs> the nine hundred forty nine thousand dollars for existing staff assumed that everybody was coming back next year okay and that they were all going to get pay raises based upon contracts, uh, step in lanes, step in lanes and, and uh, collective bargaining agreements. Okay. okay, so what happened was the building principals looked more deeply at the needs for next year? Is that? That's the new staff line, um, but you're asking about the existing staff line. Yeah. To pay for the new staff, um, new positions, uh, and to stay within a, a reasonable budget amount, the some of the existing staff um, are not going to be in the budget, uh, are not in the budget that's being presented tonight. 
Okay, I mean, I, I, I gather we'll get into this more detail right. when we're talking about the various programs, but, but I guess it just seemed like a really substantial change. It is. What will become apparent and what we're, we're doing, because we do it the way we're doing it and we do different departments each week, we want to have the opportunity to speak with any, any individual um, who may be affected by the budget next year um, before they hear it here. And so tonight we're prepared to talk about central office, curriculum, um, buildings and grounds, um, and technology with uh, in the nitty gritty and this is just giving you the overview that I know was missing last year that we were kind of operating in the dark because we didn't kind of know what's the final number until we were well into the process so this year you know first go round we were at seven close to seven and a half this is where we ended up and now we're going to go through all the details with you so you'll know and, and oh, wait, previously the way we would have seen it we would have just seen the 1.34 million right. as the increase. We wouldn't have seen that breakout, no. right, which is so it's that additional detail. So I'm sorry, I had one more question. Do you are you good? Well, I, I was just making sure we didn't move on in case Mr. Moser had anything to say because yeah, he just jumped in. Clarify, so I'm just going to sit back. Okay. So uh, is there anything in the between the existing staff from the original to updated that involves? So I know we change assumptions sometimes on lanes. Um, did we yes. reduce lanes? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. No, we did not. The 949 um, include it, it remained unchanged, based okay. upon what we thought uh, we were going to have for lane change. Okay, so this is these are. I mean, it's going to come out wrong, but those are, these are the actual. They're not assumptions that drive that reduction. Yes. Okay. Can I just ask a? Oh, sorry. Can I ask right a, a quick question about expenses? And maybe it's more of a statement, but. If my memory is correct, last year we also reduced expenses quite a bit. We also did what? Reduced expenses quite a bit. We did. We really challenged people, challenged ourselves to level fund where possible um, and questioned any great increase. Um, this year uh, we continue to do the same. So let me understand, the reduction, the 591, that's a reduction over the original requests in the 7.46. It's not necessarily... Okay, so the 336 is so the new expenses. So, so the increase is smaller. Yeah. Right, got it. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, so the next one is just a, a total recap. FY16's budget is 39,143. The FY17 budget recommendation is 40,829,000, a difference of a million six eighty six. That represents uh, a 4.31 budget increase and of course um, the town doesn't pay for the entire budget there is chapter 78 so we just want to point that out so the next slide is maybe the one John that you're uh, used to seeing uh, where the payroll uh, it's very interesting um, that it just simply remains 83 percent 17 percent breakdown uh, from year to year uh, it, it, I don't think that's changed since I've been here because you know we're out a couple of decimal points and you know it, it is what it is but payrolls up a million three expenses are up three hundred thirty six thousand those numbers tie right back to the previous slide or two slides uh, ago Bob could you go, go back there uh, which shows um, 336 for expenses in the combination of the 391 and the 958 equals a million three forty nine. So, Ralph, you bring up a good point that the eighty three seventeen yeah. seems to be our ratio every year. Uh, not necessarily a question for right now, but it's just something that piqued my interest when you said that. Is if you compare it to other like districts, is that about the ratio that you see with schools? The, the business of education takes place in the classroom, right? And so, uh, payroll is really the driver of the school budget. So I, I don't know uh, comparatively how that would compare with area schools, but I would assume it's roughly the same. I would say, John, that uh, if there is a, a district that you have more a needier population, you might find that there's more staff than what we would have here. For instance, uh, some of the schools that maybe have a more diverse population or a lot more single parents, those types of things, you might find that there's more of a staff percentage-wise than we have, and it's just based on student needs. If you have needier students, you're going to need more adults to service those needs. So, okay. Makes sense. Thanks. So the next slide is just another way of looking at the payroll changes. The contractual obligations for the current staff uh, at next year's rates 
is up $949,000. But we're going to reduce that by personnel reductions of $558,000. Then we're going to add some new personnel in the amount of $958,000. Total payroll increases net is $1,349,000. So can I, I'd like to add to this particular <coughs> slide. Um, one of the conversations, or the conversation that we were having with, um, with principals primarily, special education director was, when they would bring a request for a personnel, re a personnel increase, um, we wanted to have a conversation about what can you do without. So I was looking for a give and take. Sometimes we could do it, not always, but often. And so, I don't want to talk about um, individual schools because I want to be respectful to the process of making sure that people are aware that their position might be being discussed. But it was a consistent conversation, you've heard me say, and Jean reminded me today, um, looking at if we're going to be doing things differently, then we're doing things differently. And if we're adding on, what can we take away? Because if we're doing it differently, what we were doing before shouldn't be costing the same the conversation we're having about paper use. If we're going to be bringing on all these devices and having a one-to-one -one environment, we should start to see a reduction in paper use and copying and those kinds of things. So it was the same, and you see it here, that's a significant amount of personnel, but it was because we were had, that was the expectation that we had. You heard a similar conversation when we were looking to go to co-teaching. In order to get there, we had to reduce a significant number of paraprofessional positions. So it was similar. And as we get to each one, we'll explain in more detail um, what that looks like so that you, know, you can feel comfortable with those decisions. The next slide is uh, the breakdown of the expense changes. So in the technology area, there's actually a decrease in their expenses of uh, almost $12,000. Central office, however, there's an increase of 139,000. That's being driven by mostly by uh, transportation. Um, we considered at the beginning adding another bus. Uh, our buses at the secondary level tend to really be jammed in the morning. Uh, but you know, the more we thought about it, we're convinced that if we know um, who's going to be riding those buses by the deadline, which is June 30th, that we can accommodate them all. Um, you know, that may be a bit of a brag, but um, we have we, we could reroute buses if we only knew who was coming. So uh, we're just going to have to redouble our efforts to uh, get people to understand that we really need to know by, by that <coughs> deadline. So we pull that out. However, uh, one of the problems that we're having is that um, we don't have as much money in the, the school bus fee revolving account anymore. This year we used, I think, $364,000 to offset. Next year we're only using the 210000 that we currently have in the budget. Uh, at this point, um, the budget does not assume that there are any changes in, in the fees. Um, and, you know, obviously the school committee will, will decide that. Uh, curriculum and professional development has a, a slight decrease. Athletics is up $7,000. Prices go up, and we're assuming, again, that there's not going to be a decrease in, in, uh, in the fee. Regular education is up $50,000. That's made up of all kinds of stuff, books, supplies, etc. Buildings, grounds, and utilities is up $72,000. Um, we have a, a lot of buildings to maintain, and we don't have as much money in the revolving account. Uh, as we did in the past. Occupational day, you heard uh, at the last meeting that we have uh, two more kids at Norfolk Aggie this year, uh, FY15, than we thought we were going to have. So um, we're only budgeting for the five that we know we have next year, but the FY16 budget was light. Uh, and special ed, special ed is only up $29,000, which is a miracle. But not really. <laughs> what's, what's driving that, uh, keeping that uh, uh, increase down, is the new way of paying for our accept transportation. Our FY16 budget was about $100,000 more than it had to be because we didn't know that we were going to enter into this new agreement uh, for the new billing method. So um, we. We don't yet have our final number for FY17. We'll know that next week. 
so that number could go up, it could go down, but I don't expect that it's going to go uh, either way um, significantly. <coughs> And you have hey. questions on the expenses. Oh, sorry. Yeah, two, two questions, Ralph. Um, so understand the rationale behind the bus, but from a context perspective, wh what does a bus cost? If we About $60,000. Okay. And then second question, you mentioned, um, I understand from the, the athletics and transportation perspective, the reduction in the revolving accounts because we've been systematically lowering fees, but that's not the case for building use. Um, so are we getting less why why would why would the that's interesting because we're actually uh, this year we'll probably get more than we have uh, because uh, we're why because of tech yep. renting yep. Uh, a, a room here for 6900 bucks and for uh, the YMCA program in the past I think we got 25,000 from kids pro and we're on, on on target to make about uh, 30 to 35 on the YMCA, so there is a little bit more, but um, we have a superintendent who really cares about um, the facilities. And oh, yeah, and I'm not questioning the spend, but you had said that there was less in the revolving account, and that yeah. didn't. That well, just well, no, didn't the, the, at the end of last year, there was only eleven thousand dollars in the revolving account. So oh, over so the we past few, it more. yeah, yeah over okay. the past yeah. few yeah. years. Yeah. We're been not depleting. carrying the balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's okay. That makes yeah, because we've been depleting the revolving accounts rather than carrying the balance. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for okay. clarifying. Plus, uh, we have a superintendent. Yeah, we heard that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm in favor of. I just want to. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so, um, the last slide is, is the budget timeline, and um, that is what that is. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that might be uh, a surprise is on December 17th, I think the, the school committee probably ought to prioritize the, the capital request. Um, Al and Ashok and I uh, met with CIC last night. Uh, they didn't ask us uh, for a priority list, but it's probably wise uh, for, the, for the school committee to, to do so. Um, and I, I know that the town manager likes to get that information by the end of December, uh, just the capital piece. So. And I, and I believe the Board of Selectmen actually did a cursory review of the Last capital night? request Tuesday night. Um, yeah, not as in-depth as, as we would have liked. Uh, just a quick question on the, re on the revolving account. So is that carrying less because more of it's in the being budgeted for in the general operating budget? Uh, and buildings and grounds? Yeah. Yeah, because you know, your costs either stay the same or go up, and your offsets are going down. So to, the gap is the operating budget. Mm -hmm. So I mean, a few years ago, um, you know, I know when Al talks and, and in your packet there, uh, I think there was a balance of about $190,000 in that account. And over the years, it's whittled its way down to about $11,000 at the end of last year, uh, simply because the, there wasn't enough in uh, the budget. So we had to tap into the revolving account to an extent that was greater than um, than we were taking in. So, okay, I'll just, just save some of my questions. Sure. Yeah. We all, it's, it's worth noting, too, that we last year as a committee adopted a new set of financial policies oh, and actually adopted a new strategy with respect to revolving accounts that involves carrying fewer balances in the revolving accounts and doing more as it more of a, a sort of pay as you go pay as you collect approach with the revolving accounts so those balances are going to naturally be lower because that's the because of that adjustment okay. in, in practice all right great thank you hey Ralph to your point about the capital request yeah. so the 17th if so the 17th is a regular meeting right yes mm -hmm. so what I'm wondering is could we because it looks like the 10th which is a special meeting yeah. Should only be elementary and sped because I think technology is up there twice. We decided to have technology each time because oh, um, so they're do he's time. doing an overview. Because um, Mr. Ghosh can't get enough of us. Yeah, <laughs> but I, and then we we look to to break it down. Um, but Ashok, I'll ask that of you. Do you think it's necessary that you would there be something that you would add at specifically at the elementary and secondary levels, in uh, addition to what you're saying tonight? Maybe we I definitely come back and answer questions. Yeah. I mean, I, if I'm remembering last year's process, 
there were different times where the technology came into question when yeah. we were talking about curriculum for different areas. Whether or not <laughs> whether or not that means you have to be at every meeting, I, I don't know. I okay. do just remember that we would get to a point about something in the curriculum and it would be technology specific. Bob, as long as Bob's here. I do remember, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I mean, as so long as Ashok does his overview tonight. Right. Yeah, um, I'm happy to. But we can always call you because we know you watch all the time, so we could be like. Well, he could call us. If yeah, you, you could text the answer. Yeah. Um, so re regardless, so what I'm wondering is, if we want to prioritize capital requests, would it make sense to do it on the 10th? Yes, it because would, Because we John. don't have as much to cover. Thank you. Yep. I'll write it right in there. Thank you, uh, Ralph, for that I'll suggestion. Email you. Kathy, you have it's updated right, but it's, Do I? But that's yeah. Okay, right. thank you. With the 25th item on it. Oh, excellent. Great. Uh, okay, so we can... Uh, yeah. Send that out, maybe pack it. We can move on if you're ready. We can invite a show cup. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, if you would join us. Certainly. There's also room over here if anyone wants to join me. <laughs> Did you want to show oh. it to be up here? No, no, I don't. It doesn't matter. Whatever's easier. Probably a better mic. So, should yep. I be over there? Yep. Or? Yeah, that's fine. It's over. totally sure. fine. Be fine. careful, though, because. Uh, <laughs> John, the other back there is for Brian. Yeah, he and I are probably going to tag team. Yeah, there's another one. I'm going to give that to Brian tomorrow. All right. Oh, you yeah. want? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm going to watch a movie. I know, right? I'm like, ooh, what are the options? <laughs> Can you go make a change to that slide, or do you think it's not necessary? I have a third link. I do have copies of the executive summary, unless you already have them. They're in our book. Do we yeah. have them? Um, Looks like it. Yep. We have it. Oh, we perfect. Have it. All right. No, I wasn't sure, so I thought I'd bring some paper copies. I'd try not to print them. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for having me this evening. Um, I thought I'd start and talk a little bit about the district technology priorities before I begin and before we get into the, some of the numbers. Um, so a few of the priorities that we have uh, for FY17 really starts with the first one, which is um, looking at a new student information system. Uh, and I just want to point out that this is an uh, item that uh, will be listed as one of the capital items um, that was presented actually last night. So it sits outside of the normal revolving accounts. Um, and this is really uh, the main system that supports all of, um, all of the um, student information that we have in the district, which re replaces IPASS. Um, it's been uh, a great system for many years, uh, but it's now come time to upgrade and move on uh, for a number of reasons, which I can get into um, in just a bit. Um, and so it's been in the capital pipeline for a little while, and this is the, the year that we're going to take a look at it. Um, the second thing is personnel, um, as Dr. McLeod had mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a big focus area uh, for the technology budget this year. Uh, we'll be looking to um, add a few positions, um, one being a new data analyst position, a new technician, and then we'll talk a little bit about the restructuring of the current staff that I have. Uh, the third priority is maintenance. Obviously, we have a number of systems and pieces of hardware in the district, um, so we'll focus on maintaining the existing equipment that we have. Um, priority four is looking at hardware upgrades. Um, we're looking at teacher laptop cycles. Uh, labs for a few of the buildings and continuing to update some of the existing LCD projectors in some of the classrooms. Um, finally, number five is software consolidation. Um, so there's actually some, some cost savings in this area. There's not an expansion here, but I thought I'd mention that because we've been able to consolidate some of the software we've had and save some uh, money for the district. And finally, professional development will continue to provide professional development for teachers as we migrate into these one-to-one -one learning environments. But at the same time, um, I do want to point out as we move forward that there was some reductions in this area, uh, primarily because we've started to leverage the train-the-trainer model. So we've actually had a few years where we're training staff internally, and now those staff are being teacher leaders and are training some of the other teachers as we move forward. So there are some cost savings uh, from that approach. So the, the overview, um, the three areas uh, for this year's budget, 
Uh, the number one priority and focus is personnel. The second area is technology support that supports instruction. And then the third area is going to be technology maintenance. <clears throat> so just to talk a little bit about the personnel, um, which is the main priority. Um, the first area is restructuring. And this is to take a look at the technical staff that we currently have um, on hand that are within the district, primarily the technicians and um, the um, network admin and data manager. Um, and after many years of discussion, we found that there's a couple areas that we need to improve on. And we need to, A, create a pathway for these technicians as they come into a district and grow and develop. We need to have uh, steps, and we're kind of looking at switching and migrating from uh, an hourly system to a salary system and having steps uh, that are based on skills and license and certifications so that they can move and grow um, as they come into the district. Uh, the second area is uh, a full-time student data coordinator. Um, this position is really intended to help uh, teachers. Uh, there's been a lot of requirements put on the teachers as far as crunching numbers and uh, providing student analytics um, to kind of assess instruction. And so this, this person will primarily be taking data, putting it in, into a more digestible format for teachers, and helping share that with teachers and helping teachers analyze that data to make instructional decisions. Um, and the final um, position is a new, new full-time technician that would be district-wide that will help support um, the added devices and technology that's currently in the, in the district. Um, and the real driving factor uh, with that is the one thing we looked at is the ratio of, of devices to um, technicians. And currently, with the four that we have, it's around one to a thousand right now. So it's pretty high, and, and it it's, creates quite a bit of workload uh, for our technicians, and it really gets to a point where we're never able to quite complete all the tickets that we have in our ticketing system to manage day-to-day uh, -day tickets. Michelle, um, what, what does the state recommend on that? I know we're 1 to 1,000, but what would the state The state in an advanced district is looking for a ratio around 1 to 400. Um, so uh, with the increases and in additions of devices over the last two years, that number has really jumped up. So. Um, it's really a priority to make sure that the, the technology is functioning on a day-to-day -day basis uh, so that teachers can really focus on instruction and not worrying about whether the machine is going to work that day or not. Um, and the second area is really, you know, ticket turnaround time. You know, how long does it take for one ticket to get turned around? How many days or hours does that uh, occur? And, and we really would like to reduce that so um, teachers um, or students really aren't put out of their, their way. Uh, so that's the, the main focus uh, of adding another technician. Before you move on, can sure. I ask, um, with moving positions from hourly to salar salaried, and this might not be a question for you, it might okay. be for Mr. Dumas or Dr. McLeod, but what, uh, what benefit impact is that in terms of it, when you move from hourly to salaried, it usually has an impact from a benefit standpoint? So the, you can answer the benefit. Yeah, if there people is. people get any benefits, that's yeah. charged to the town side. There's no change in benefits. But the hourly piece, Ashok, you can answer that, you know, in terms of the hours that they had to put in over and above in the summer. Um, yeah, I mean, part of it is that, you know, as far as the answer to the question, as far as Ralph's saying, there is no, there is no change in, in benefits. Most of the, the, the staff have full-time benefits currently. Um, but the, the one benefit we'll see is we do temporarily have summertime help that we hire. So there's a reduction in that summertime help as well to pull in this position. Um, because of the amount of work that happens uh, over the summertime. Um, and on top of that, there's, there's a number of events, right, that happen over the course of the year, whether it's supporting things like town meeting at night or if it's supporting a certain event at a high school or a building. Um, oftentimes, we have to pull them from the day so that we don't end up paying them overtime so that they can work some of those, those events or shuffle the schedules around, which puts us in a tight position sometimes during the day. So. Having this flexibility in a salary type position will give us, you know, hopefully, um, help us better meet the demand that we have currently in the district. So the big change that we anticipate seeing that is a reduction in overtime or the need to even worry about overtime. Yep, there's the overtime. There's just the professionalism, I think, as well, in terms of how dependent we all have become on, as Ashok said, making sure that our technology is going to be working for us. We've become, right, this is just my office, and if it's not going to work, it, unfortunately, everything's in it now. 
um, fortunately and unfortunately. And so it's the same for the teachers. When they walk in the morning, they're ready to do a, cl a lesson. We're encouraging them to use technology to capacity. If they go to use it and it's not working, obviously they can teach without it, um, but it's frustrating. And so, so that's the other impact is, is just maintaining a level of professionalism that we can count on, um, who know our teachers, who are part of our work, care about our district. Um, you know, that's what what Ashok's trying to do. And I would say the other the other key point in the restructuring is obviously retention, which was brought up earlier. But retaining the staff that we're currently paying and professionally developing, exactly. uh, so they don't leave and seek out another position for a higher rate of pay, which is which is an ongoing struggle. And I think that's critical what you just said. You know, the training, the certifications that they're getting, that we're sending them to things to increase their um, their their abilities. Um, we don't want to increase them and then lose them. So the idea of having this restructuring, which you can see is n not a lot of money in the in the big scheme of things, um, really really buys us a lot uh, in terms of maintaining and having sustainable staff. Um, How do contracts work with technical staff? Are they part of any kind of a teachers they're not association? Under any other contract? They're we're not. saying creating no, staff no, and. So they're just hired like I'm hired at my company. They're just hired like a yep. person. That will employ you. That will. That will employ okay. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. They're not unionized. That's correct. No, they're not. Hey, can we, hold on. Can we Sorry, okay. So two questions. Um, one, so the student data coordinator, that was something that, that jumped out at me because this is obviously student data. Mm -hmm. Dr. McCullough knows where I'm going here. It's, it's sort of a hot topic, the amount of data that, and assessments that we're collecting. So just to, to be clear, because you mentioned the replacement of the iPass system, but this sounds a little different. So this is somebody who would be assisting teachers with the analytics around the student the student achievement data, the, mm -hmm. the, the student, all those baseline assessments, mm -hmm. et cetera, helping them create those analytics. Yes. Correct, but in addition, um, and this is an example of the give and take. Yep. So this has cr been creating a, a new need in the district because of the huge amounts of data that we're using. The fact that we're collecting data, but then wanting to do something with it that will inform instruction now, not next year. Right now we're having very intense, not intense, very uh, intentional <laughs> conversations about, okay, where are we? It's December. How are kids doing? If they're, if they're struggling or if they've been struggling last year and they're still struggling this year, lots of data that can support know, helping us know what to do differently. But as Ashok said, the time component is huge. So what this, this position has arisen out of the reduction of the curriculum position, partly the reduction of the curriculum position at central office. And when we get to central office, we'll talk more about that. Um, but realizing that that role has really changed and morphed and more of the curriculum work is happening at the building level, but there's a real need for taking this data that's been analyzed and being able to really provide that kind of connection to at the teacher level who might not have that level of expertise to analyze data in that way. And just because of the nature of it is why it becomes more of a technology job than a curriculum job Correct. necessarily. Yeah, and th okay. those worlds are. I mean, I know that they're. I know they're closely linked, and I know at the end of the day, the org chart doesn't really matter that much. But but I just that's kind that's of it's, it's a it's a it's a different kind of position to see in the technology budget it is for us, and that's and why again, I wanted why to highlight it. I think it's it. so unique. And can I ask a question though, and then also <clears throat> um, offer a comment? I mean, as far as the student data coordinator, I feel like this is something we've been hearing about for a while and I feel like it's very consistent with everything you've said since your interviewing process really which is a at that time you were telling us you have so much data and you have no idea you don't have the ability to use it or you're not using it effect effectively and that's been a big focus of our strategic plan and your curriculum work with uh, your professional development work with the teachers so at the same time you have teachers who are teaching and now there's a learning curve of using the data, you know, learning to how to crunch and, and turn the data around efficiently enough to have an impact, a, a real-time impact on those students. So I see this as really critical support for all of that, basically. I mean, if, if I understand the point of this position, it's to really help facilitate that process that we've all put a lot of time and energy and money into creating. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Um, and the question that I have, because I barely know how to use iPads after however many my something 20, 19th year in the district, um, 
is there money in the budget for parent training for whatever is the new <laughs> <laughs> version of iPhone? Yeah, there there is, and it, it's going to be a year-long process. Yeah. So we're obviously going to transition and migrate over a period of time because there's lots of people, obviously, that will need to be trained and updated on the system, and there's also a lot of data that will have to be migrated. Okay. So, uh, you know, if approved, it would the, the data migration would begin in the summer, training would begin in the fall, sampling, and then the initial outline suggests, you know, early migration in the spring. Okay, so and we're I still assume there's also going to be training of the staff to do the input. Correct. And so, and then just to circle back to the data coordinator, I assume also that this person is supporting Linda Henderson, who, mm -hmm. or, or working with Linda Henderson, who, as far as I can tell, is superhuman in the amount of That's work correct. that she turns around. She is superhuman. That's correct. This, this, her, this position will definitely support Linda okay. in all the work that, that Linda is currently doing. So that's sort of where it fits in. The so maybe to answer John's initial question and your, your question a little bit, um, the reason this person is not sitting out in the world of curriculum and is under technology is the fact that uh, some of the work will be working directly with staff, and that's the curriculum part. But another large component of this is what happens behind closed doors, and that's going to be populating systems, putting kids' names in, updating schedules, all that type of thing. Some of that will happen during the year, but a large part of that will happen at the end of the year and over the summer. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the overlap will happen with Linda Henderson. We still need to have her dedicated to making sure that the information we get off to the state is accurate, mm -hmm. that we get to the federal government in terms of civil rights is accurate, and those reports and th those tasks are becoming larger each year. Mm -hmm. So we need her to remain dedicated to that, and we need to take some things off of her plate. So that's what this person is also going to help. And we've had a lot of conversations around that about how could we sort of chop up one job and another and still make this all work? And it made a lot of sense at that point, John, that this person has to sit under technology because they have to get trained in how do you set this program up? How do you import schedules? How do we make these things work? So at that point, it just made a lot of sense as that's where this house, this person should be housed. Do, from respect to that new student data s system that you're talking about, I know it's in a capital article. Have we has it been selected, or are we procuring it? No, the the team is just uh, beginning to meet uh, this week. Um, we're hoping to go through a series of processes and have a selection, you know, in late spring. Okay. So there will be a series of rounds. Uh, there'll be criteria defined. There'll be community input. Um, there'll be staff input, um, and then a selection um, in late spring. So would the target be that we say late spring that we might have a selection by the time we go to town meeting, or ideally, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the goal. I mentioned to Bob while we're here, I went back to the first capital uh, plan that was in place when I got here five years ago. And uh, the replacement of a student information system w at that point was scheduled for FY15. Mm. So it's been in the pipeline for yeah. a long time. Mm. Absolutely. So this moves us on to the expense summary side of the house. Um, so I talk a little bit about these are some of the major accounts uh, within the technology budget. Uh, and the first one really is the network infrastructure. Um, there is a reduction there of $3,500. Um, this account primarily supports existing uh, infrastructure, primarily the wireless networks uh, in the various buildings. Uh, so the money that's in there now will go to, to maintain those systems, but also um, add uh, a few access points uh, in some of the public spaces where we have large gatherings where we might need additional coverage for events like town meeting or where we have big professional development opportunities where we might have hundreds of people there. You often need extra access points that have the bandwidth necessary for those trainings. Um, the, tech, uh, now the tech contracted services account is also down $4,430. Um, the reason for this uh, kind of reduction is because of a consolidation. Uh, we were able to move uh, some of our products that were housed in the cloud internally, so there was some internal software that we moved in that saved us some money. Um, so there are some reductions there. The AV supplies and maintenance account uh, is split among all the buildings. Uh, there's, uh, these cover uh, major equipment repairs, replacement costs across the buildings. Uh, they typically pay for repairs like uh, microphones and sound equipment, uh, additional sound cables, um, and just the general upkeep of the equipment that we have. The technology maintenance account is uh, up $10,000, and this is primarily due to the increase of uh, the equipment and the technology uh, in the district over the past two years. Um, and this is the main account that, that really focuses on all the maintenance. Anything that's really electrical or plugged into a wall that has to be repaired throughout the district usually comes out of this, this account. 
Uh, continuing with the expense summary, the instructional software count uh, is down this year uh, because of those consolidations we talked about. We did some surveying and really looked at existing or old software that we had that where it was not effective or not being used in the, in, in the way we felt fit and decided to reduce some of those. But also that was to bring on maybe some new software. So even though there's a, a reduction here, um, the consolidation also allowed us to, to bring in new software to align to district initiatives and building initiatives, um, allowing us to still move forward. The professional development account um, is down $25,000, which I mentioned a large part of that reduction is due to the train the trainer model, where we've trained uh, staff internally. Um, and so instead of, uh, as an example, instead of sending someone else to, let's say, a Google Summit for a training, uh, we're now hosting a summit internally um, and running it ourselves. Uh, so doing things like that has allowed us to reduce our professional development um, budget. Our technology department also presented at MassQ this year. How many, right. how many presentations? We had four staff present at MassQ, which is great. Uh, yeah. yeah. Which was really exciting. This chart kind of uh, illustrates and highlights the different instructional technology accounts uh, throughout the buildings. Um, the pre-K, uh, there was a reduction uh, primarily because of the, the laptop cart that was purchased for them last year, so there's a reduction there. Um, at center school, the increase there is uh, continue to support uh, the teacher laptops and uh, new projectors in the building. Uh, the same is true for Elmwood. Um, the, it, the big increase in Elmwood is primarily due because of the laptop refresh. Um, but also what's not mentioned there is we did migrate some of the iPads from one building, from Hopkins, to Elmwood. So in, in order to clean up the accounts, we moved that lease expense to the Elmwood school. So if you're doing the actual math, a part of that increase is due to the existing equipment that we already had. Um, Hopkins school is up. Uh, $10,000, that's due to new um, laptops and projectors for the building. The middle school and high school are both down significantly, um, but even though those are down, we will be upgrading the graphics lab at the high school to maintain um, the computers in that uh, building and then additional projectors, which are uh, still aging and failing um, in a lot of these spaces. Can I ask about center school sure. with the projectors? Are those going to be movable? Yeah, and it's very few. So I say projectors. I looked and cut that significantly. Uh, a lot of the projectors were cu cut significantly. A lot of the budget was <laughs> cut significantly. So that is really funding maybe two to three projectors. And we'll keep those primarily uh, to see if a projector goes down, then we'll replace it. Once we replace it, we can actually move the hardware to the new building. We won't move the wiring. So do we use the same projectors throughout the district so that if you had something as a backup for one building and another building went down, we can interchange? We're working that towards that. Okay. We currently don't, but as, as, as I've taken over this position, we've done that. So we primarily support two models, an interactive model for the elementary schools and a non-interactive Epson model for the secondary levels. So those are the only models we're putting into the buildings now so that we can consolidate costs around replacement of lamps and, and things like that and repairs. So that's currently what we have, but we still have older existing projectors that are um, different models. Yep. What is the cycle for the teacher laptop refresh? The cycle for the teacher laptop re refresh is four years. Four years? That's correct. Is that based on a warranty or what um, is that number? Well, based on? the Apple warranty that we do carry is a four-year warranty for Apple parts. Um, but primarily it has to do with a number of, of issues. Uh, teachers are power users. Um, they require um, a lot of power, um, and over time, some of the, the devices, the battery life decreases. Um, as the software gets older, it's, it's more difficult to upgrade the software to the latest operating system, which then sometimes causes conflicts with the various software suites that we have. Um, a lot of times, it's just slowness, bugginess, um, which leads to problems with teachers running the day-to-day -day lessons that they have. So, you know, for example, now with some of the elementary machines, uh, they get that spinning wheel of death that we can't seem to resolve. And what that does is even in the morning, it puts them off from taking attendance. You know, so the first thing they have to do is open that computer. And if they're having trouble taking attendance, that puts everything off you know, throughout the rest of the day. So we've noticed that more and more with the elementary machines, and it's, it's definitely time for a refresh. 
Kelly, those machines are worn out by four years. If you imagine a teacher typing every day, taking it home, doing those things, those machines are pretty beat up. We've tried to put them on carts and put them in different locations afterwards, and it's just a few of them that we're able to actually bring forward. They're pretty beat up at that point. I would say even if you might even be looking at three years, and they'd still be pretty pretty taxed by then. So four years, I think we're getting we're getting our money's worth out of that. Actually, kind of interesting because I was going to say in private industry, I see a refresh sooner than four years. So I thought it, it, it seems like a reasonable amount of time. I just we're not working off of max, so it might be different based on the operating systems. But at the same time, that seems like a lengthy period of time, especially with how much the technology and software changes year to year. So good point, Lori. Thank you. They still we'll still keep them, so I don't want to say that we're just throwing them out. They will they will be used in, in the cart based model for for some of the schools as well. So they'll still stay with us. Other questions about? Um, I, have, I actually laptops. have a question about laptops because sure. um, we're in our. Our, our senior class is our first laptop class, so and so so the kids can either just return the laptop or buy it for a dollar. Do you have That's any correct. sense of what your yield is going to be and and what the what will you do with the ones that are returned? Do we return them for? To Apple or no? I mean, they're, they're, I, I would imagine ninety-nine percent of the parents are going to buy. They've already technically paid for them. It's really a right. matter of paying the dollar. So, the value is taking them and even you know selling them or keeping them and using them. So the value is for the the parents to, to buy them and take them. I, I expect very little okay. uh, returns. I don't have an exact number. Uh, come February, we'll put out the letters uh, to parents saying you know it, it's time to, to to purchase the laptops. Here's the dollar and the final amount. And we'll get a, we'll get an idea then of how many may come back, but I and think it's going to be a very small number. If they're purchasing them, will they have to be, you know, wiped of? Yeah, typically the management software own. will yeah. come off of them, um, but then uh, any any software typically that's on there is was bought. <coughs> most of it was bought with the machine, so it's it's owned outright. There is a few <coughs> software pieces that we put on, like math software, for example. That's a uh, yearly piece of software, we can automatically pull that off. So because they're managed, we can pull and push software. So we can pull that off. And we'll, we'll take them in, clean them up, and then uh, give them a receipt if they paid for it, and away they go. Awesome. OK, thank you. Any other questions about the instructional technology slide? OK. And that kind of kind of wraps up. I mean, this is uh, any, any time for further discussion uh, about the items. And this is a Hopkins. Uh, class actually doing some hands-on creative work. The iPad is there primarily for a resource, so it's, it's another way to use a device besides, uh, they're not always just sitting in front of devices, obviously. Mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of ways to enhance instruction, so this is just another example of it. Uh, uh, have you met our new director of IT? I have, yes. We, uh, we've met a couple times. I saw him last night at the CIC meeting, and then um, we met and debriefed a little bit uh, last week, and uh, touched base with him this afternoon, so yeah. Because there had been some um, cooperative projects that Chris McClure had run um, before he left town. I didn't know if uh, maybe you and, and Josh would get a chance to sit down and see if there was any any matchup on the town side and the school side on equipment or contracted services or infrastructure or anything sure. like that that might be able to save some money for, for both both yeah, sides. absolutely. I mean, we've had some initial conversations, and obviously, we, we still started and, and led the safety security idea. So that platform still exists, and there's some shared resources there for the town to take advantage of, um, as far as the software side. Um, and there's also some, uh, you know, moving forward, some opportunities uh, to basically collaborate on a number of things, especially with the shared data center. So I think we're we're looking at. Currently, what's available there, and he's still trying to figure out what what he has and what he has access to. But I think moving forward, I think there's opportunities for consolidation around you know data and talking about like how we can you know digitize more things and, and make our normal workflow and process day to day processes more efficient. Good. Um, so I think we've had some initial conversations, but I think there is some opportunity. All right, good. I just want to make sure you guys were talking. Yeah, so. yeah. He's, he's been great. He's been a good hire. So good. We're Thanks. Happy. I have just one, sure. um, and it's it's hearkening back to recollection of last year's discussion, sure. and where we were rolling out 
more technology to another grade level, and it may not be for you, but it, for the team as a whole, sure. that's not here. So are we already at where we want to be, or we're just not looking at it for this year? So thank you. Um, I'll just jump in there and then give it back to Ashok. I wanted to point out on one of the earlier slides, but it seems self-evident, and when Ashok came back with his original initial ask, it in did include that next step, which was presented last year in his technology plan. Um, we asked him to prioritize because the percent was too. So he put that on hold, reduced his budget by over half a million, significantly reduced because when we said, what can wait, he said, my priority is personnel and everything that he just explained to you. And the, te uh, the, the um, actual rolling out of the devices can be put on hold. We do know that for 2009, for FY19, to, when do we have to be ready to do PARC or MCAS electronically? Uh, 18. 18. 18. So we have to be ready to do it electronically by 2000, by spring of 2018. So what was the rollout? I'm sorry, because I'm not recalling. Oh, okay, that. so we needed to, the next step would have been Elm. Yeah, so uh, let me just back up and start by what's existing. So cur currently we have a full one-to-one -one program at the high school, which is obviously um, a, either a, a purchase, a lease to own with a laptop, a bring your own, or loaning from the district. So s parents have options on how they participate in that program. Mm -hmm. The middle school is currently a one-to-one -one program, grades six through eight with Chromebooks that are, that are obviously funded by the district. Um, Hopkins School is a two-to-one model now in a, with Chromebooks, so they have a cart-based model where basically two classrooms are sharing one um, cart of Chromebooks. The elementary schools are at around a six device in a center model, six iPads uh, in both center school uh, in Elmwood, so six iPads per classroom. Uh, we have, and we're maintaining basically a lab at Elmwood School still. Um, there's a semi-lab in the library uh, of Hopkins, and then the only lab we're maintaining at the high school is the graphics lab. Other labs have been broken down or are, are recycled. So I know this was already taken out for this year's budget, but what would have been the next rollout? The next rollout would be moving towards a one-to-one -one environment at Hopkins, at Hopkins. Um, okay. with Chromebooks. Uh, we find with right now the challenges they have that uh, they're they're great and they're they're loving the devices, but because of the team structure and the structure they have, it's very difficult for them to use them in the way they want because of the the way the sharing of the carts is set up. So they love them; it's great. They're working, uh, but for moving forward, I think uh, a one-to-one -one is going to be better. We're still with carts, you know, not at that point taking them home yet, but having them based in carts. So to get back to what you just mentioned, Dr. Yes. McLeod, we need to get to Hopkins and Elmwood. We do. We need to get to at least Hopkins. Uh, we, we have the option, obviously, to decide what we want to do, and I think that uh, Elmwood would make the call as we get closer. Is it uh, going to be paper-based or is it going to be electronic? And I think some of that doesn't necessarily revolve around do we have the equipment here at Hockington? It's are the students prepared enough to take a test online and show everything that they really know, or should we stick with the paper? Mm -hmm. So we'll make the call at that point in time. Maybe we need another year or two to practice and get a few more devices in those earlier grades and, and have the students take some high-stakes tests in those earlier grades, and maybe then we'll be ready to say, yeah, we're ready for grade three. But we certainly want to be ready in grades four and five. So I know that in this number is definitely going to change each year. The pricing changes. But, I mean, if, if it had been included, you were saying it was a half a million? Not for the not It for wasn't just the devices. devices. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, if we're looking at adding additional um, Chromebooks, just at uh, Hopkins, for example, um, it's not it's not a huge addition, you know, roughly you know thirty thousand or so um, to get additional Chromebooks. You know, that's an, an at least model, not okay. purchased outright. But I, I know this is all hypothetical, and you had mm -hmm. to already take it out, but right. it's just helpful for future planning. It is knowing what we have coming up, mm -hmm. um, and and also to know what you were forced to take out. So. And you can see all of that in all of the backup pages. You'll be able to see the detail because you didn't have it in advance this time. Yeah. You weren't able to, but you'll be able to look and see, you know, where things were level, where things were reduced. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for in the future, adding. too, I'd be happy to share. I have a, a forecast, too, with, with uh, the instructional technology accounts that I can share with the committee that kind of maps out 
my expected expenses for those types of uh, purchases over the next 10 years to right. give you an idea of where we're going. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just to have a quick comment. So, so, um, so, Shoke, it sounds like you're really combing through things to, to consolidate software, consolidate the devices we have, and try to kind of pare down the do just a couple different flavors that are easier to maintain, more usable. I can't say I'm at all sorry to hear that I passes. <laughs> it's going to be gone. <laughs> that You're was, not alone. I, I call it uh, I passes my frustration. <laughs> um, and this, I do have a question though, and this probably isn't the format to answer it, but it, at some point, is is there going to be some some evidence base for where? there's instructional improvement, what grade that starts to happen with the technology is. So I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm listening to this, I think you're doing good things, but just on a curriculum level, is it is it a proven benefit to have iPads in Elmwood and iPads in Hockington or, you know, when does that start to prove a benefit? So what a great question and I, I would be delighted um, to work with Ashok um, and with Bob to put together a presentation of the many, many ways the biggest thing that comes to mind, John, when you ask that question immediately to me is engagement. Mm -hmm. Student engagement and individualized learning. Those two things are, and then of course, aligning that with, with, with um, evidence. But when we see kids who are engaged and who are not just sitting in the class, you know, right, we know that they're going to be much more successful. We can also individualize instruction much more easily when we have um, technology and then the third area is for students who struggle in terms of you asking for evidence we're having that very conversation right now which is to say if kids have not been achieving with their current program first of all what is it what have we been doing is it working and if it's not working then what's their profile and what do the, what kind of um, support or program do, that they need we know that often it's something that we can have we can provide through technology and now we and it's much more easy it's easier to individualize in that way, mm -hmm. um, then we can track the student progress over that eight to 12 weeks to have a comparison in terms of how they were progressing before we provided them with this improved instructional um, approach. So those would be really exciting things to be. Every time I visit a building, I'm, I'm just blown away by watching what's going on in classrooms. And when you talked about the lab at the Elmwood School, I was there recently watching a class of second graders using Google Map. But not only were they using Google Map, like they were mapping their own home, their own neighborhood, but then they had um, some kind of a graphic organizer that they were using to collect their data and store it in folders. And I'm watching these kids, you know, just <coughs> navigate all of this. But it was so individualized. It was fascinating to see. So um, I just see examples of that every time I'm in, a, I'm in a building. At the Hopkins School, they were doing something uh, that had to do with re with um, responsive classroom and students having to be able to, um, you know, stand up to bullying or something like that. Um, but the quantifiable piece is a really, really great um, goal for us to have and to begin looking at. I'm convinced about, it's just natural to think that engagement is going to increase learning, but we need to be able to look at and, and apply that directly to, to the technology improvements. So um, I will make note of starting a little. And John, I would just simply file. say that uh, in terms of quantifying it and doing that, our ending goal is for students to be able to do this higher order thinking in this electronic environment so they can excel on whatever assessment that, that they're taking, whether it's an MCAS 2.0, whether it's an AP test, whatever it is. And so we want all the students, the device becomes invisible they're able to use all the tools, they're able to think and apply what they know, and, and, they, and it shows up on the device. So at that point where this does become invisible, where I know enough about the, the tools and how to use it, that I can show you this higher order thinking here, mm -hmm. that's our ending goal, that really is. And so we want to be able to provide the students with skills so that no matter what the environment is that they're being assessed in, th th they can excel at it. Well, that's, so. that's great. Thank you for the explanation. Sure. And it, sound, it sounds like it's going to be really interesting too with the with the data portion. You know, when you start to get meaningful data out of that, and then what you can do with it. Yeah. Um, I just want to confirm: no drones in this budget. <laughs> no, 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 not this no. year. Okay. <laughs> I thought I know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Excellent job. Thanks, Ashok. Welcome.
And it, le it looks like what you achieved tonight is that you don't need to come to the next two sure. meetings. So um, well, mission it's off the slide. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> off, except you might be on call. <laughs> but might be, but you're, you're not on the slide, so there you yeah, go. Let's come back to the Thanks so much. You, know? you okay. being here kills our ratings, though. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you're not, you're not watching. No one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you mean. Oh, you're trying to show up. That's true. Oh, thank you. So our next yep. is Mr. Rogers with Buildings and Grounds. How are you, Al? Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lori. I'm, I'm assisting in the technology. You, oh. <laughs> you are? You're doing an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you get set up. And do we have any presentation or is this? Nope. Okay, great. So he'll speak from the overview. Perfect. Um, Ashok did his overview. Technology director did it. Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> well, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we I was go. thinking about some... Little Video graphics, videos video I clips. It's true. I didn't show my video on the show Okay. So um, the I, well, let's we'll, we'll start with um, let, extraordinary. Let me let me stop okay. by asking if they've ha even had a chance to read it because we didn't get it to them in advance. So have you? Right. You have not. I'm assuming I'm you have not. Right I'm reading now. right now. Okay. okay. So then <laughs> you do need to go over it in more detail. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Great. So we'll start with um, extraordinary maintenance. Um, and at, uh, at the Elmwood School, um, we um, want to um, fund some um, recarpeting of classrooms. Um, eventually, you know, hopefully in the uh, renovation of that building, we'll be able to um, rip out all the, the carpet and, and um, do the whole building in VCT, which is a lot easier to maintain. Um, and it lasts longer. Um, Painting the common areas, um, hallways, doors, uh, the gym, um, those types of things. The exhaust fans are, um, most of them are original to the, to the, um, the last renovation in 89. They all need to be replaced. So those are all the rooftop exhaust fans. Um, repairs on unit ventilators. That would be um, replacing valves and motors and... Uh, those types of things in the unit ventilators. E each classroom has a unit ventilator that supplies heat and fresh air to the space. Um, we also need to replace the rooftop condensing units for the, uh, for the library and the computer lab. Um, I got some help from an engineer last year um, to help guide on, on how we can do that. So um, we're prepared to do that now. Um, and um, I, I cut the uh, the painting by half to support some other stuff, and we cut some carpet replacement also, you know, just to, to prioritize things. Um, moving on to Hopkins, um, RTU two, which is uh, the rooftop unit that um, supplies heat and air conditioning to um, the core of the building, the library, and all of the classrooms that are in that middle section. Um, there are two. Um, compressors that supply air conditioning. Um, both of them um, were limping along and failed over the summer. We were able to replace one. This is to replace the second compressor. Uh, the middle school, um, continuing um, um, some painting. Oh, excuse me, that was delayed. <laughs> the, <clears throat> to uh, paint, repair, and move um, some, some lockers. The um, lockers that were put in in the 96 um, renovation and addition um, are in bad need of paint. Um, and also, um, we'll have a locker company go through and, and make repairs so they're easier to open and close. And, and um, the principal wanted to move a couple of banks of lockers too, so that's figured in there. Um, it was prior practice to um, when when uh, a student was in a classroom and had some hearing problems, um, they would carpet the whole classroom. Um, I started, uh, instead of carpeting the whole classroom, I started using area rugs so we could move the rugs with the student. Um, so a lot of those carpeted classrooms, 
um, the carpet is, is in pretty bad shape. And um, we also had offices uh, in, in those areas um, before we moved across the street. So um, we'll be ripping out the carpet and replacing that with VCT, which is easier to maintain and it lasts longer. Can so. you just tell me what VCT yeah. is? <laughs> it's um, vinyl composite tile. Oh, okay. So it's the um, one by one tile that you see in the corridors in the classrooms. Um, we're going to make some engineering upgrades, uh, um, engineering lab upgrades. That's the former um, wood shop. Um, we split that in half uh, two summers ago. And um, we'll be making electrical upgrades, plumbing upgrades, um, carpentry. We're going to be putting some doors in, painting, painting the floor um, to support those new programs. And um, we've delayed a, a request to. Um, air condition the conference room. Uh, at the high school, <coughs> um, there's, there's two transfer switches for the um, emergency power. So when um, that switches power from street to uh, generator power in, if, in a power failure. So we, there's two transfer switches there. One of them is for life safety, um, which is things like um, some emergency lighting, um, servers, um, the PA, the phone system. Um, the secondary one that, that does most of the lighting, um, the freezer, the walk-in freezer, the, the refrigerator, those things. Um, that one we've, we've had trouble with in the past. It's failed twice, so um, it's been recommended that that be replaced. So. Um, let's see. Some electrical upgrades in, uh, in science and uh, project areas. Those are classrooms that we've made into science rooms and found that there's not enough outlets. So um, um, we'll be hopefully doing that. Um, and then we, um, a request to um, replace the scoreboard with uh, two LED scoreboards was moved to capital. So. <laughs> Uh, and then um, system-wide, um, we'd like to purchase a, a scissor lift to help the maintenance guys get, uh, it's, a, it's a more stable lift. Currently, we have one-man lifts, and they're very um, shaky. <laughs> uh, and the scissor lift will be able to get closer to walls so they can work on, on, on wall spaces. And that'll be district-wide. We'll be able to move that around. And we'll be able to store it at the new building because there's going to be space. Yes. When we met <laughs> yesterday, they talked about <laughs> They talked about having room for a scissor lift storage, yep. right? Yeah. Perfect. Um, personnel, um, I'd like to increase the, um, the maintenance staff by one person. This, this person would be um, dedicated to uh, grounds. Currently, we have one person dedicated to grounds. And um, you know, if, you, if you read the, <laughs> the paragraph there, all the things that maintenance does. Um, but there's 20 acres of athletic fields that are um, very high maintenance, you know, lining, cutting the grass. During uh, sports seasons, the gr um, grass has to be cut at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Um, they have to be lined, fertilized, seeded. So this person would assist in that. Al um, provided us with comps to other surrounding districts with, with similar types of um, yardage, footage. Um, and we're definitely low with one person. Uh, in, in addition to the fact that we've been, you know, there's, there's been a lot of um, public comment on the grounds. Um, we, we are proud of having people come and visit, walk the Loop Road, all of the different, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful acreage. Um, but to be able to maintain it in the way that it deserves to be maintained for one person is just not possible. Um, and in addition, during the dormant months, which are, you know, they're, 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 this, the season is long, um, but during those months when we can't be doing as much outdoors, certainly they can be helping with snow removal, but um, they can be an additional inside maintenance worker for jobs that we can save until the winter. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in in terms of, you, you know, Al did a lot of research on this. We also had an outside auditor come in to give us some comprehensive um, um, comparisons and recommendations, um, and this was one of them. Mm -hmm. 
So um, <clears throat> last year we were able to um, put a maintenance person in, in each building. Um, but, you know, right now we have to pull those people out of the buildings to uh, help with ground, so we'll have to do less of that and less contracted services. You know, we'll be able to do more of the stuff in-house. Mm -hmm. And um, we try and um, purchase equipment that will help out in those areas also. So. Um, I'd like to add a half a custodian to, uh, to the middle school. Um, this would bring it bring the, the middle school into more into par with the high school. Um, right now, um, each custodian is responsible for about 35,000 square feet with this other half position. It would be down to 31,000, which is more in par with the high school. Um, <clears throat> that person would also, if um, people are out, we could, I could move him around and, or her around. And uh, You've had it certainly expenses around you know overtime because we can't find subs um, and having somebody like this that would know the buildings and know the rest of the staff instead of having to incur overtime um, this individual could could be hired at, at a sub rate um, and so that's another another benefit but it's also um, in keeping with comparisons and recommendations we're still high <coughs> I was going to say we were low but we're still high even with the additional halftime person um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real need. I know that there are, have been things in the past um, that were just cut from, significantly cut from buildings and grounds because it seemed to be an easy place to go, and, and I think it's showing. And it's time to get uh, ourselves back to where we need to be um, in terms of the buildings. And um, so uh, just want to put in a, a, another just just it, there was a lot of work that went into this this recommendation and and thank you Al for all of that um, the utilities have been level funded as as is uh, contracted services um, <coughs> the um, grounds maintenance account was reduced by sixty eight hundred dollars <coughs> and um, that um, a additional contracted. maintenance person. Partly because of contracted services, right? Right. Yep. So the maintenance average contracted right. services. I mean, grounds contracted services. Right. <clears throat> the um, custodial supply accounts, we um, we keep very good records, and um, we averaged over three years what our use was, and this reflects that um, that use. We're also doing. <clears throat> um, um, of the uh, well, we're we're doing inventory, um, and I I have a, 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 a um, vendor come in and he does inventory quarterly, and um, he tells the head custodians more or less you know what they need rather than you know ordering too much stock. So mm. so we only have stock on the shelves that we actually absolutely need. So mm. things don't sit and get stale. Same thing with um, toilet paper, paper towels, and that stuff. Um, and the rest uh, reflects what um, Ralph was saying about the uh, the revolving funds. Yes, right over time, right? That has been depleted, and you can see that. Mm -hmm. You ready for questions? Questions? Sure. I have a couple questions, um, and they're and they're kind of they're kind of actually specific instead of high level but just anecdotally I've been hearing a lot about the phones in the high school phone system not working are, are you is that a significant problem is that addressed in here that's actually um, a show <laughs> oh, okay it's a good thing you're here <laughs> thank goodness you said the question was the phones in the high school yeah in the Middle classrooms school. You can answer me school. In the high, school. high schools yeah sit right here sit right here to be honest, I don't have any recollection of that was getting to our team as far as being a major concern. So okay. is it ongoing or is it a one-time? I mean, I just anecdotally, I've, I've been hearing about it uh, in terms of some incidents that happened in the classroom and not being able to reach the nurse. And then as part of the Alice drill, I think that was some feedback that the kids gave about the new, you know, teachers having challenge with the, um, operating the new 
phones in the room. But I don't know personally uh -huh. how widespread it is. It could be two okay. or three people. I just was There are a lot more user-friendly than the system yeah, we had I mean, before. Yeah. What I can do is follow up with Alan and, and figure out what the specific it, uh, it's high issues school, not, Oh, sorry, yeah. the high school, and see um, what the issue was, um, and then talk to techs. But as far as the, the functionality, the general functionality of the phones, it seems it's like good. they're Didn't they've been, they use they've been great. Didn't they use Prices Go during the Alice drill? Yeah, they did. They yeah. used the, uh, uh, we're testing an app uh, but that they were working on. Um, so I can I can check with them, definitely see. But as far as the general functionality of the phones, uh, it's been they've been great. Okay. Um, I mean, and you would, work. in the normal course, like a teacher would fill out a ticket and you would get notified of it that way. That's right. how that That's works. correct. And if there was a major issue that, um, you know, Evan noticed during the drill, he would definitely email me or pull me aside and say, hey, what's going on with this? Yeah. Um, and even today we're testing the, we're trying to make Evan be more mobile in those types of situations, and we're actually <coughs> testing the phone system to be able to page from his cell phone. And we, we actually got that to work. So the phones are, are pretty functional, and so we'll work on the, the issue if there is one. Okay. I don't think I have other maintenance questions, but I, I yeah, I mean, I do, I do agree that this has been an area that's taken more than its fair percentage of hit um, when years were leaner. So uh, it's not a surprise that your list is pretty deep. <laughs> And I know we're not getting all of it, but it seems like you've prioritized really well. Yeah, Al did a great job of prioritizing. He came in with a list, and then those priorities went quite a ways down. And we challenged him on a lot of those to come up with this final uh, budget that we pulled together. So we did a great job. And he has a great team. He really <laughs> do. Yep. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Um, Al, I should know this, but I can't remember. Are any of the buildings Energy Star rated? Um, they're not Energy Star rated, no. Um, we've made great strides in, in um, um, energy management. Um, we went through and replaced uh, lights a, f a few years ago. Um, we have LED. All the exterior lights are LED. Everywhere but center, um, all the exterior lights are LED. That's probably the next step is, is uh, LED interior. When, when we did the, uh, the interior um, lighting upgrades, the LED technology wasn't where it is today. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, that's probably the next step. To, um, but Dave Del Torrio and I will be more, um, working on the next uh, Green Community Grant, so um, that will probably be part of it. We've also upgraded our... Um, uh, bu building management systems, the HVAC controls, so um, you know we can put things in unoccupied mode when uh, when people aren't aren't using them. Um, there's also um, when spaces aren't used, um, air handlers will go into standby mode. Um, there's um, um, CO detectors that uh, can detect this this room. Um, if we all left the room, um, the the CO level would go way down, and the uh, air handler would go into uh, standby mode. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you know the temperature would be lower, and uh, the the blowers would only come on when when needed. You know to maintain that lower temperature. So, so we've made great strides. Uh, have have any of the buildings undergone a, a comprehensive audit? We um, we had Rise Engineering come through. Um, uh, three, four years ago, Ralph, and um, did an energy audit, and we, you know, we we addressed um, a lot of issues. Uh -huh. So I saw the utility utilities were level funded, and I know sometimes the, with a retrofit on LED, <coughs> you can end up saving a pretty substantial amount of money. Same thing on on HVAC upgrades and, and things like that. So I just wanted to get a little more insight into what the plan might be there, the long term plan. John, our, we'll do that. our electricity bills, and I know this isn't usage, but the electricity bills, you'll, you'll see it there. In FY12, we used $718,000 of electricity. Last year, we used $503,000 in electricity. Some of that is due to price reductions with, with contracts, but most of it is, is due to a decreased usage. Um, the, uh, the solar on, on top of the middle and the high school help. Uh, in the work that was done at, uh, I think we did it at Hopkins, the middle and the high school, mm -hmm. um, over the years, um, has you know dropped our usage down. 
significantly. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. So, so along those lines of, of electricity usage, I recently learned a, a program that Acton Boxbro did on load shifting with the with ISO, and they saved like tens of thousands of dollars just by shutting down for a few hours on a couple of days during the summer. Are we doing things like that also? Well, um, we, at, of course, during um, school breaks, you know, it, th there's no night use, so, um, you know, we're shutting things down then. But during the day, there's, there's a lot of activity going on, even during the breaks, mm -hmm. in, in, including the summer. So. Mm -hmm. But when, when, John, when you're talking about load shifting, because I don't know that term, um, I'm assuming that if we were to turn things down or shut things off, um, does it take more energy to get it back to? Is that what you mean by load shifting? No, it's, like? it's, it's a little more complicated. I can follow up with Al. I just, I just was curious if it was something we were currently participating yeah. in. I mean, if it's going to save tens of thousands of dollars, we're going to want to know about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a great thing to learn more about. I'd like to know more about load shifting. <laughs> Google it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to Google him. <laughs> All right, those are great questions, and I've made note of, um, you know, this idea of, you know, what, what plans can we have for the future? Obviously not, would not be in this budget, but um, for HVAC and LED lighting and just planning for those ongoing improvements as we, as we move forward. Um, yeah, sometimes stretching those out isn't always the most economical yeah. case. Yep. And uh, as Al pointed out, some of the technologies have evolved now where sure. it might be uh, enough time has passed since RISE had been in here to, to re-examine it. Yep. Great. The LED lighting is not just a energy saving, but it's a maintenance saver too. You know, there's a lot less. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work involved in in maintaining uh, the fluorescent lights, uh, ballasts, and bulbs to be replaced. So. Well, I thought about that when you mentioned the extra staff member, and I was curious how many hours are spent on bulb maintenance now, versus if if we went to an LED solution interior, if that if that would be enough hour offset where you wouldn't need the staff position. Hmm. But, yeah, I don't know. Well, one of the things that Al wants to do <clears throat> and wasn't able to do in this budget is to be able to um, hire somebody who has HVAC certification um, and and train or, or and or train somebody. And we had looked at what the cost of that would be um, because you have to get a, you have to get somebody from outside to come in to do that work currently, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's another thing that we're looking at in future budgets is to be able to have those those skills and talents internally. Um, so you've been starting to think about that. Anytime we, we bring an outside company and we have to pay them prevailing wage, well, we, we don't have to do that to an, for an sure. employee. So I'm, I'm sure there's more things they could do than just change light bulbs. So. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you can keep them busy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm all set with this one. No, this one was so I, for it. I just had two. Um, and Dr. McLeod, one of them was a comment you had made about saying with, in terms of I think the middle school custodian that we were still high, were you talking about the square footage to person? Yes. Okay. I was just making sure I was understanding. Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously there's quite a few um, delayed improvements or um, you know, uh, maintenance projects that you have on here. I just wondered if there was um, any way to quantitate what those delays amounted to in terms of what yes. we pulled out. Yes, yes, we have those numbers for you, and I can get them to you. Ralph, Ralph made it, uh, and I didn't bring it. Um, a comparison in terms of uh, percent, and um, and then you could that would be a helpful document to look at when you look at the supporting um, spreadsheets. And I mean, obviously, I, I, I'm. I'm certain that your prioritization was right on par, but nothing that was delayed was going to cost us more money in the no. future if we didn't do it this year. Okay. Mm -mm. Great. That was all of my questions. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. I guess just one, one last thing would be, yeah, Al, is to, if you could <clears throat> make sure this information gets over to Dave. It sounds like you're working with Dave, because I'm just seeing as we look at our comprehensive camp update that we're including your your numbers in what we see also okay thanks so you'll get that today yeah, yeah you're always you're in communication yeah we're actually meeting um, after my vacation we're gonna, we've set up a meeting to um, to go over that and um, and prepare for the uh, 
the Green Community Grant. Great. Terrific. Thanks. Al's heading to England. Oh, exciting. What a great new grandchild. Do you speak the language, Al? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Al, thanks so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Um, and I know our next presentation is um, Dr. McLeod and Mr. Burlow. Um, please excuse me for starting because I have to run to the ladies' uh -huh. room, but you guys will get started. Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah. You sure? yeah, you absolutely we can. We could just chat. It's okay. We already had. To I could talk about yeah. Elliot. We had to put enough filler into the meeting Something already. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Yeah. I'll start with the budget overview, and then uh, Kathy going? can jump in. So this is going to cover both the um, the curriculum side of the house and professional development. These uh, budget items uh, align to a lot of the strategic uh, plan initiatives. So I didn't list them all, but they all come under the headings of curriculum instruction and assessment, as you'd expect in here. Um, as Kathy, Kathy mentioned earlier, we had some questions around this early on, which was the uh, existing staff versus the new staff and, uh, and how that decreased. One of the conversations that we had um, as we worked towards uh, reducing the initial asks to what we are at now uh, centered around uh, positions and in the world of curriculum one of the positions that ended up uh, not making it across the uh, the budget horizon was the elementary curriculum curriculum director's position so that's been eliminated currently from the budget um, the work that's being done currently by that person is going to continue obviously because it, it impacts a lot of the strategic plan initiatives we're going to look to leverage existing staff that we have and some teachers that have stepped up into leadership positions to continue the work and to see that it uh, goes to the next level. Um, as well as the assistant superintendent will take on some of that work as well. So the more that the SMLs are able to do in the high school, I feel the less that I need to spend uh, my time there on a regular basis. So I'm able to refocus a little bit more on the elementary uh, le grade levels. Bob and I led um, in the administrative retreat this summer. Um, we talked a lot about teacher leadership and sustainability of initiative. And um, we did, did some readings around it and worked as a group around it. We went to a training this summer um, along with Karen Zaleski, um, led by Dr. Paul Ash, who was the former superintendent in Lexington. Lexington. Um, and we learned a lot um, and, and talked a lot about the fact that People, teachers have to own the work. They have to understand the curriculum. They have to be part of the decisions that are made in order for there to be buy-in and sustainability of the work. And it's not just about aligning it and packaging it up and putting it in an electronic binder. Um, and we've been really working towards that with the admin council. Um, I believe in it. I really believe in it, um, that, that that's where it needs to be. But you have also supported us in being able to do this work by increasing, for example, um, the number of curriculum teacher leaders. You know, when I got here, there were none, right? And then we started with ELA, and then we brought on math. There were none in the elementary. At the level. elementary, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then reducing the, the amount of teaching that, this, that the subject matter leaders are doing. So that's a piece of it. But you've also supported the addition of assistant principals into the elementary buildings and then increasing their days from 185 to 210. So that, those have all been things that the school committee has supported that has allowed us to really provide more building-based work in the area of curriculum. So um, as we've examined where are the things that, um, where there's duplication of effort, um, we feel that this is one that, that we've, we want to be able to think about doing it differently. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to bring your attention to is the fact that the um, ELL staff is now not in the world, the budget world of special ed is now in the world of central office. So what you'll see is there's a fairly large staffing increase, but it's not necessarily because we're increasing staff. It's been transferred out of the world of special education into the uh, assistant superintendent's office. Um, there are, however, uh, 1.2 additional positions. So there's 1.2 new positions, and this is to meet the needs of the number of students that we have, the number of ELL students, English language learner students that we, we have. 
we believe that that will meet our current population. Uh, and that's a total then of five positions that will show up in there. 3.8 existing that we have right now and 1.2 additional one. Uh, this year you'll see a reduction in the textbook asks, both for the elementary and secondary level combined. Um, we uh, were able and we were lucky uh, to be able to use F1 funds in the past to offset this, but that's not able to be done any longer. That account essentially is paying for our salaries and we're not able to use it to offset textbooks. So we sat and took a very hard look at uh, additional textbooks and uh, so for this year, we're moving forward with uh, Chinese texts and Spanish texts. And that will cover the high school for the Chinese and the Spanish for the middle school. Those are the primary things that you'll see in there. There are some, uh, there's a writing program under the elementary text that we're going to bring to address the needs that we've identified this year in grades four and five in Hopkins School. Do you want to add anything, no, Kathy? No, okay. good, thank you. Professional development, it's very focused. Uh, even though the overall account has been reduced, what we've done is knowing that we're going to ask for a little bit less, we're really sharpening our vision and focusing on less. So we're going to do less total initiatives, but we're committed to uh, those initiatives. One of those initiatives is um, in the early grades. Uh, this is the kindergarten up through grade, part of grade three, all of grade two, but few teachers in grade three. And this is... Uh, to increase their um, foundational literacy skills of our teachers. In all of the elementary grades and part of grade six, it's increasing their uh, math content ability, what they understand with math and their ability to use it to teach more effectively. Um, and those are what we're really focusing on. Those are some very large things. Across all grade levels, we're going to continue to focus on looking at data. How do I more efficiently look at data as a teacher? And how do I let that inform instructional decisions? So that's going to also continue into next year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, there's some more, little more details underneath, but essentially I've covered it in the overview. So, Bob, pr yes. so programmatically, there's no, obviously, there's no significant curriculum program that we need to bring on or upgrade as we have in, in past years. No, what we're looking at and what's on the horizon, uh, you asked to show some of those the questions, what yeah. can we expect in the near future? Well, because I know there's, we're still, I, I thought we were still aligning the standards in certain subject oh, areas, are. right? Yeah. Science is the big thing that's coming on. Okay. So we're going to do that internal study and then that will show up definitely as, as um, uh, under textbooks and some other materials for next year. Okay. It absolutely will. The, uh, the timeline that the state is giving us, it's two to three years. They're going to come out with the exact guidance next month on that, all that. But they're saying that that's a lot of schools' time to sort of figure it out and get up to speed in terms of budgets and supplying and training of staff as well. So has that guidance been slower than expected? Cause I, oh, yeah. Okay, because I feel like we should have been expecting it in this year yeah. based on what I heard in the past. But okay, so. We're, we're yeah. more than a year out than what I thought we would be initially okay. when they gave the original time frames. And the other thing that Kathy and I have started to discuss is this need for, is there a need or, or is there not, or a little more structure in the elementary grades for a literacy program and what that might look like and how can that really be, uh, what grade level would it sit in and how, so we're in those initial phases for that, but that's something I think that you'd expect to see over the next year or two as well. So it's science and it's that early literacy. We've pretty much covered the gamut with world languages. We've got our programs have all been updated. We're committed to having a more rigorous program, and that's what we dedicated the last few years to. We upgraded the math texts as well, and we feel we're in a pretty good place with that. Uh, we've begun to do some things with social studies, so there might be some additions that you see in that world as well. Okay. So. so two comments, one, one in terms of um, at the elementary level, that this is going to come back around when we talk about um, world language expansion mm -hmm. and the need for where do you find the time to do all of the things and the decisions that we have to make about what the priorities are. Um, so we're going to talk some more. I'm very excited about some thoughts and ideas, not in this budget, but going forward in terms of providing a really, a really great science program at the elementary level. Um, so that will come back around when we talk about, uh, when we talk next week, when we talk about the uh, middle school budget. Um, and then the, the second part of that was, oh yes, was that we have to always be aware of the fact that at the elementary level teachers teach all content areas. So when we're bringing in new initiatives and professional development, 
we can't do it all at once. We have to be very respectful in terms of if the focus is on math, and that's what the professional development is, we can't also bring on a literacy program because the same teachers are, same, are teaching all of those areas. And so we've really, Bob's really worked very, very carefully at doing that um, and in providing professional development that is not just a one-shot deal. So some exciting things happening this year around some professional development that it happens initially and then a second visit back with the same provider who actually goes into classrooms and models instruction has been having just really great results. And then the third thing is the con continuation of a program that started K-1 is now being looked at as far part of their, their new initiative 2-3. Um, so all of those connections are, are happening through this work. Um, and so as a result, we don't see big program asks right now because it's more about instruction and um, and that's the focus. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do central office now? Can okay. I ask about um, more questions, curriculum sorry. first. Uh, and well, may, yeah, I think this is probably the right category. Sure. So, just sort of to piggyback off what you were talking about, Kathy. Yeah. The last couple of years, we have had big program asks in this area with mm -hmm. the full day K and the co-teaching, and this mm -hmm. is sort of a, uh, uh, we don't have that this year, which is a, a welcome relief because we've, you know, we've done a lot in a yeah. short period of time. Um, and I think we've talked about, you know, at some point getting some, maybe too early, but getting some feedback or data about what the payoffs are starting we're starting to see from those investments that we've already made and the one that I think is sort of still hanging out there and we had this presentation a month or two ago about the foreign language um, it looks like there's we're not implementing any 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 changes to foreign language or is that going to be when we hear from the schools Next week. So, so we're going to talk, we're going to be prepared to talk about that, our recommendation. Uh, I know I've sent you some communication from me just to give you an idea of where that is in this budget. Um, but we, we, we have that committee, as you know, and we wanted to frame the discussion around the middle school budget because, um, and we've met with Marilyn Miracle and, and with the committee, um, because the decision about expanding is a, is a K-6 decision. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we wanted to frame it less around central office and more around um, middle school and elementary curriculum discussion, uh, uh, building base. So when we bring in that level next week, starting with the middle school and high school, um, if, if it could wait. It's Two not, weeks. it can't be. It's, yeah, 17. Oh, Secondary is next and then elementary? No? Okay. I stand corrected. What are we Whatever doing next they week? Come. Elementary. Oh. Elementary and special. And you can't know about it. No, we'll start the discussion. <laughs> Can you wait? I, I'm, not, I'm not a patient girl. Okay. But I just feel that, you know, just in terms of, um, I don't know if the if that group is coming. I think we talked about inviting them. I don't know if they okay. are. I think we're going to present. Okay. Okay. So we we have certainly had a lot of discussion around it, but if it's okay, we probably yep, no, be better that's fine. prepared. I okay. just, that was the only curriculum-related thing I thought okay. was. Central office? want to move on there. Sure. Is there any other comments or questions? No? Nope. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Central office. Bob, you're up again. Actually, that's me. Oh, never mind. <laughs> We're going to let Ralph start So, uh, yeah. as you might imagine, I would prefer that you look at the numbers. Okay. Okay? Because I think it's, it's an easier explanation. <laughs> He's a numbers guy. <laughs> rather, rather than focusing on the executive summary, which confuses everybody all the time because of the negatives and the offsets. I don't know. They're doing all right. Well, it confuses me. <laughs> okay. So uh, it starts off with the professional salaries. Um, the uh, salaries of individuals uh, in central office uh, for FY17, they're budgeted at FY16's mm -hmm. actual pay. The FY16 budget was based upon what they were making in FY50 because we didn't want to presume that there was going to be an increase for salary employees. So. What you see there for the superintendent, for example, is exactly what she's making now. The next line down is the salary reserve. It's a lot lower this year. In FY16, we had to fund uh, salary reserves for everybody except for the custodians because they had a contract going into FY16. So FY17 now, the only people who have not settled 
with the caveat that I'm assuming that the teacher contract will be ratified. The only folks who haven't settled are the nurses, and then the custodian contract ends at the end of this year, and um, any non-unit people. So that's why that's gone down. The assistant superintendent salary, as I said, is what uh, the current salary is, as is the business manager, as is the business staff uh, salaries. HR, the reason for a decrease is because there was an interdepartment transfer of an individual from HR to the assistant superintendent's office. Um, the teacher intent offset, it's about the same from year to year, uh, from FY16 to FY17. The background there, what that number represents, teachers throughout the district uh, have to inform us in October of every year of their intention to change lanes in the salary grid. In other words, they're going to take um, graduate level courses that are going to qualify them to move a column, which is a part, which is a way that they, one of the ways that they get a raise. Well, in each teacher's home department, we budget for the value of 100% of those uh, lane changes. Mm -hmm. But we know that they're not all going to uh, achieve those lane changes. So what we do is we take an offset. It happens to historically been budgeted in central office. These numbers uh, assume that only 30 percent of the value of the lane changes will actually come true. And historically that's been about the number. I think one year since I've been here um, it cost us a little bit of money. But the other years it's been pretty much on target or we've saved money on that. Okay, so uh, HTA retirement incentives, um, HTA members have to give us advance notice of their intention to retire, and if they do that, they get $2,500 a year for the last three years of their careers. So this year we only have, FY16, we only have one person who was in that pipeline. Next year there are three people in that pipeline. Teacher longevity, um, well, as, as people stay here longer, they um, qualify for longevity. And most of that is teacher. Some of that has to do with central office staff, uh, custodians. We just lump it all into um, a central office teacher longevity account. Under secretarial, secretarial and clerical, um, the school committee secretary is unchanged. The superintendent's assistant, that is what she's making now. Here's the other side of the assistant superintendent secretary salary. The reason it's not identical is because the pay rates are slightly different between what was budgeted and what the person actually is making uh, in that transfer. Central office extra help, uh, we're zeroing that out. Um, we have used it in the past. Mostly it's used if we need some extra hands on board when we're doing bus passes. So if we need any, we'll use the bus fee revolving account. It's not a lot of money. Uh, sub, -collar, uh, sub collar pay, that's what she's making now. We haven't funded the attendance officer for uh, several years. Uh, crossing guards, this is the only uh, increase that we're requesting, uh, and it's not budget to budget, it's an increase of 0.2. We actually have the person hired. That was brought to your attention when we did the financial report a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is just to continue funding that position. We now have um, crossing guards um, in the morning at Hopkins in center, as well as uh, the high school over near the White House and the high school down near Maple Street. And, in the, and then in the afternoon, we have um, the, the fellow who directs traffic in front of the high school. He then goes down to Hopkins and does that. We also now have uh, a, a, a gentleman directing traffic out in uh, East Main Street uh, to help the center school buses get over to the um, Elmwood School quicker. We have a new crossing guard, which is the point two. Uh, in the morning, she does in front of near, near Hopkins in the afternoon, and then she runs over to center school um, and, and does some I think there she as well. Yeah, she does. She does. So well, this is all because of you know increased vehicular traffic, increased yeah. foot traffic, 
uh, it, it just makes it a Safety lot safer concerns, and it gets safe. those buses moving. Mm -hmm. um, so the offset by other funds, uh, as you know, two of the um, crossing guards uh, are, uh, are funded by uh, parking fees because they're directing traffic here at the, at the high school. Um, superintendent's contracted services, um, that's made up in FY17 of two things, the cost to audit the end of the year report, um, and um, uh, we've increased that this year because the price of the audit is up a couple hundred bucks, plus um, we're assuming that we're going to need some help as the town and the school department uh, um, transition into MUNIS, the MUNIS HR module. Um, and we think that you know we want to have a little bit of money in our budget to um, <laughs> you know ma make sure that we ma make it make it work right. Uh, the school physicians, what she's making now, uh, transportation, it's only up 1,900 bucks, even though I'm as assuming a two percent consumer price index increase, because FY16's budget came in. Uh, FY16's budget for busing is higher than we needed because we assume the consumer price index would be 2.5%. It came in at 0.7%. So um, even, even with a 2% increase, it's only going up 1900 bucks budget to budget. Homeless transportation stays level. Uh, the next one, school food services. This is something that we've been talking about at the end of the year for the last few years. Regulations changed, and now at the end of the year, any uncollected debt uh, school lunch is charged by students that go uncollected, um, the regulations no longer allow the revolving account to carry that balance. So we've had to charge it to the budget. The, the school committee has, that was brought to, to you for approval at the end of last year. Uh, that was $30,000 just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was it's, just looking at that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's now, you know, we, we really hustle after that, uh, but still there's always going to be something outstanding at the end of the year. Um, there's only one way to stop that, and that's okay, to say not, no charging, and we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, the, the offsets for bus fees. Get the cheese sandwich in there. Yeah. <laughs> offsets for bus fees, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we, we've been going to the well. Uh, this year we collected $210,000, and that's all we're putting against next year's budget. Um, School committee supplies, that's an account that's been budgeted and not used, so we zeroed it out. Postage, we level funded. Office supplies, uh, assistant superintendent supplies, which mostly covers um, materials that are needed for the new teacher orientation. Yep. Um, school and the committee. Admin retreat. Yeah, the admin retreat, that's right. School committee conference, that's if you go. Uh, nobody seems to have gone uh, the past few years. Advertising has to do with help wanted ads and uh, bid advertising, central office travel is to cover any um, um, mileage reimbursements for central office staff. The school census, um, that's a charge that uh, ha has gone, um, gone back a number of years where the town clerk undertakes a, a census of uh, town people and uh, in, in particular they're looking for school age children. We get uh, charged uh, for a portion uh, of that uh, that service, and the 975 bucks is what the cost was in FY16. Emergency prep, uh, we've dropped that down. Um, we've spent about forty thousand dollars each of the last two years. Uh, nevertheless, uh, funding to cover replacement of two-way radios and batteries is in there, as is funding to, for a new mobile communication uh, and notification system that I think somebody mentioned earlier. Crisis Go, Crisis go. Uh, has, has been included. School committee legal, we leveled. Um, technology, uh, we decreased by 1,200. Um, the, the copier equipment, that's for excess copy charges plus um, any uh, um, toner <laughs> and that sort of thing. Life insurance, uh, that covers uh, life insurance policies that are in the uh, individual contracts for all the administrators. And then the new equipment, that's simply uh, the annual lease cost for uh, one of the copiers in central office. So overall, um, central office will cost $2.2 million next year, uh, which is $530,000 less than this year. But obviously that's artificial 
because of all of the changes in the uh, salary reserves, but um, it is what it is. Happy to answer any questions. I, 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 I'm assuming that this is the time, would be the appropriate time to talk about the, um, the fees because this is when we're talking about. Yeah, this is probably the time because we're talking about, um, and I know that it's it's athletic as well as transportation. Um, I know that there had been a commitment on the part of the school committee to reduce fees. I believe until there were none, um, and so we we bring the we bring the budget to you where it is at this point as far as we could get it. Um, if that's a priority based on past agreements, um, then that is something that the school committee will need to discuss and take up and, and, and then give us feedback on. Um, our discussion on this was, was lengthy um, and really in the end we are, are feeling, um, because we weren't here during any of the discussions about fee reduction, was that we feel that the fees are reasonable. We feel that what people are being asked to pay um, for transportation and for activities is reasonable request um, and allows us to be able to come in at this level um, but that is it's completely up to you to have that discussion I think this is a good time to begin it because it's maybe not either or it's maybe reduce one and not the other and then asking us to go back and find other places um, where we can can reduce so so it, you, you guys can ask questions first on that, but it was like my top question on here. So. Okay. Because um, I've been hearing it all night. Yeah. Um, that, that they're leveling the fees. So I, because I recall during our budget discussion last year that when we came to the end and saw the astronomical percentage and realized that that was one of the items that we might need to take off. Yeah. Um, it was quantified for us what. And I think I was not on the committee when that promise was made either, so I don't know what the discussion was about it. My understanding over the past few years, and this might be both a question for those members of the committee that were here and also for you, is was it a 10% discount every year or was it just discounting the fees? No, it was 10% every year, which is $50,000, I think, Ralph. Well, right now, uh, if, you, if you decreased the fees again, uh, it would increase the budget by thirty-five thousand dollars. So it's and it's the same because we didn't decrease every fee, right? We targeted no, targeted transportation, no. and, transportation and athletics. Those and are the only. Athletics. Yeah. Those are the only parking, fees. parking, transportation, transportation parking. Oh, and yeah. athletics. Right. Right. But we didn't parking like well, we, and it was yeah. I think it was full decay, but then we don't have that yeah. anymore. But then I think like F one we left alone. Right. Um. Yeah. Preschool, we increased. Yeah, Preschool, with, we increased. With parking, you, sh you should probably figure on 40. I, I neglected to think about that. One. Is there? That's about another point oh oh one or something like that. So, and I feel like I'm asked this every year, so I probably. Is there a way to differentiate? I'd, I'd be really interested to see when we talk about the transportation fees. The. Is it sixth grade and below? It, where we only charge mm -hmm. people who live within two miles of the school? Mm -hmm. Seventh grade. Below what, seven. no, let, let, six six grade and below. below. Yeah, let's flip yeah. it the other way. Everybody from grades 7 through 12 has to pay regardless right. of distance. K to 6, if they live inside of two miles, they have to pay. So so for, so for the, the reason I ask that question is, so as I think about the, the fees, um, I know we've been reducing the athletic fees. I, I'd, I'd actually like to see some numbers on that. On, on because I honestly don't remember where we are um, and what the total revenue is for those. So I think some, yeah. I think we need some of the yeah. numbers to I have this discussion. we need that data. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to see the transportation fees broken down because for me personally, the one fee that continues to bother me the most is the transportation fee for grade six and under because it, it it's a fee we're allowed to charge if they live within two miles of the school, but it feels like a really unrealistic rationale for a fee. You know, kids who lives at the bottom of Ash Street gets charged to take a bus to center. We can't expect them to walk. That, that would take some number crunching because uh, we don't necessarily capture that. Yeah. Um, you know, you're either eligible or you're not. Um, but I'm sure we have the information and would have to manipulate some spreadsheets. Um, it would also result in a significant increase in number oh. of buses. 
Right, if we're now transporting all children K-6 right. at where no it gets cost. Tricky. Everybody's going to want to ride. Yeah, everyone's going to ride. Well, and, and, yeah. are you talking about a reduction? You might, not you might end the traffic gripping. with the parents that drop off and pick up, though. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> and managed might, quite well. Yeah. Like, that's not but, been a big issue. You might have to cut something else as a result. But if you I'd would like us to give you the data, to that's see, what we're hearing. see the data because yeah. I, I guess. Can we see from where it started and yeah. then the ten percent in the years? I don't know if it's been three or four that you've done the ten percent. I think you're asking two different questions. Mm -hmm. You're asking, you're you're asking what the changes in the fees has been, but you're mm -hmm. asking how many, basically, how many kids, how many kids are eligible, or how many kids live in that two mile radius and how many of them pay to ride the bus. Mm -hmm. So yeah. basically what is, the, what is the number of people who are refusing to pay a bus, bus fee because how would that change your ridership if there was no bus fee? Uh, I mean, again, I'm not suggesting necessarily that this would be where we go no, because of the question. revenue impact and the potential bus impact, but yeah, to, to sort of thinking about it, if we were to eliminate right. the bus fee for the kids sixth grade and younger, what's the impact that would and be so that's a revenue impact and then if I, I know we can't say a kindergarten who's not taking the bus will start taking it because they don't have the fee but we we guess at first blush let me let me throw this out at you be, because grade six is the is the is the the grade that messes up the whole thing <laughs> because the grade six kids ride to school with everybody else 7 through 12 and those buses are jammed in the morning so if you gave a free bus pass to every sixth grader you're putting you're putting all the sixth graders who currently don't ride the bus on a bus and yeah. there has no room for them so and again I understand we could be talking about a significant expense change logistics resulting from this and I'm not saying I, that's why I want to see the numbers because sure. on the flip side of it, I continue to believe that this is a fee that is, quite frankly, unfair, because we can charge people who live within two miles. If we could charge everybody, I'd actually be less, I'd have less of a problem with it. I just think this is sort of it, it's an arbitrary, antiquated law in Massachusetts that allows us to do this and doesn't. So that's okay. it's the one that. Yeah. Not, not oh. to get political, but I have to. I, I can't. I can't bite my tongue on this. Uh -oh. When when, uh, when <laughs> Governor or, when Romney first became governor, his first okay. budget included uh, a section that would have eliminated the mand uh, uh, mandated busing, which would have meant that everybody would have had to pay. I said, "This is great." <laughs> I'm not sure I like that either. Well, but. It would have been no, equitable. It would have been equitable, but I'm just saying. But you, <laughs> you just said yeah. that you wish you could charge, you would feel no. better. Ah, that's better what said. I, could, I feel better than the current structure. Yeah. I'm not saying well, that. There, there was oh. that, there was the that paper proposal tomorrow. that would have changed that, uh, but obviously it went no. But I think there's also a practical concern here, is that we are not in a town where all of the within two mile radius is actually a suitable walking right. environment right. for those little kids mm -hmm. and and I mean I can right. say that as a parent and I can say and I know exactly how far two miles is from Elmwood school in some of the neighborhoods up by Saddle Hill Road and I'm sorry having a kid walk on that is just not possible but, but, but the I, thing I, is, I is that I think that the other consideration that we we haven't talked about and I don't know how much it matters and I don't know how much this conversation happened when you were discussing the reduction of fees but there are other districts that charge for all bus usage no, right no, no you yeah. can't they can't yeah. Yeah. yeah if they live over two miles and they're their case over you cannot two. charge them okay so we are only charging for those that we are legally allowed to charge for yeah. we, we had talked yeah. one time a few years ago about creating a walking zone right. I still have all of that all of that data and that went nowhere fast. That'd be good. But we could have eliminated a couple of buses by having a walking zone with legitimate sidewalks nice. in the area. I like that. Exercise, fresh air. 
I have a feeling there'll be a crossing guard or something. Well, actually, there, but so, John, just to clarify, yeah. you want two things. You want um, the, the dollar impact, the cost impact of not charging K6. So I understand what you're looking for. You're wanting to know just basically what are the numbers? How many kids who live less than two miles are riding the bus? Yeah. That's what you want to know. And then you also want to know, all of you, the impact, the data on... Um, what would it? What would the percent? So I heard thirty-five thousand. If we reduce 40. another forty with, with parking, yeah, with parking, forty yeah, thousand um, to reduce a ten percent um, in the budget, and what that would do to the yeah. four point three one. Like and we usually, and we usually get when we have the fee discussion. We usually there's a table right that shows us like the, the fee. Yeah what the expected revenue that comes yep. in for it is. So I think I think we need that to have this yeah. discussion. Yeah, we have time to get okay. to that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. And so then I don't John know. The only, has comments. I the only other it. thing I would, I would <laughs> see, I'll also ask is, so, so speaking as uh, we were on the committee when this started, but one of the things that we looked at in this discussion is obviously we're not the only district that charges fees. So I know that there we had some comp data. Yeah, that, that I can still get a hold okay. of that. I don't know if that would be helpful, especially I would tell you we're a lot lower work. than right. uh, I mean, yeah. anybody. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Kathy said that. I, and, and that is true. Our fees are lower than than most, if not all, comparable towns. But um, it, 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 so that's correct. I, but I will say in the, in the time that, OK, so first of all, we, there was a time where there were no fees. And then there were years where the budget increase for the school department was and the town was like three quarters of a percent and there were no options and this is true with, for every town and this is when every town started putting in fees and and the conversation and that was before I was on the school committee so that's like I don't know if there was electricity there was not LED lighting um, but the conversation was you know we really have no other alternative and when we're able we'll reduce this because you know, to pay to get to your free and, uh, you know, required public transportation, uh, uh, public transportation. So, so when we started to come back out into better economic times, the conversation was now it's the time to start. You know, someday you've got to do it. We're going to draw the line in the stand. We're mm -hmm. going to start. We're going to do it over 10 years. And this is maybe we've done it. Mm -hmm. Three years or four years in a row, but what I the point I, that a po point I also think is important to make is that in that amount of time, although we have reduced those fees by ten percent every year, particularly at the high school um, level, and I'm not thinking clearly about the middle school. There have been oh also the middle school. There have been a lot of other new fees added in that didn't previously exist. So laptop. Right before when when we started fees, there were you were not and and you have a lot of option. I think we've done a great job of providing alternatives for parents for laptops, which are expensive. But that's something that didn't exist before. The fees for all of our trips, which are not required, but are certainly highly regarded and an important part of our experience. You know, I mean, it's going to cost a thousand dollars to go to D.C. this year. So those fees have increased. So, you know, we are trying to reduce and have so far stayed true to our commitment to reduce the transportation and athletic and parking fees but in the meantime other fees have either been introduced or increased as well so I just think that's an important thing to consider and I know that this is a conversation we're going to con continue to a different meeting but I know you are alternating with with Brian and I want to make sure that you had the full context um, of sort of how we have arrived to the point where we are right now thank you so Jean that's my long-winded comment and just in that vein, I have to repeat what I've repeated for four years. Please don't bring the, the bus fee to zero. Because if you do that, you're going to need a lot more buses at the secondary level. Because you'll have to have a seat for every kid, 6 through 12. And you're going to need a lot more than 24 or 25 buses uh, for those kids. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I can't help myself either. But. So it was never practical for my daughter to walk along 495 on and off ramps to get to Elmwood. We're also going to have over 200 units of affordable housing 
within two miles of Elmwood. And somebody brought up a really good point about traffic. Maybe there's a better way to do this whole thing. That the, the community may accept just a higher cost of transportation in the budget, spread out in a little in a little more equitable manner. And it might be worth taking a look at how many cars would we get off the road in the morning if we did something like that. So just a couple of things to consider. Um, I understand why the fees are in there. <clears throat> I understand why we want to get rid of them. And with the change in housing in Hopkinton and the traffic patterns, maybe, we may, maybe it's just a bigger standalone budget item that the community accepts to achieve a couple of things. But I wouldn't recommend getting rid of sixth grade, Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> some, some communities do have transportation outside of the school budget because the law requires the town, quote, the town to provide transportation. Um, most of the time, that's the school department, but well, uh, some have it uh, on the town So side. to just extend what you're saying, you know, there are years where we can afford things as a town more easily than other years. And so if we were to completely eliminate the bus fee, there would be a year where there would be a major increase in that particular line item. And then it would you know, it would still be bigger, but it would not increase as exponentially. And so, to your point, there may be a year looming where that's where where you can project that that if that's a goal, that that would be more easily absorbed um, on the tax base than in another year where a lot of other things were coming on or other important projects are already in line or whatever. So, I mean. I think that needs to be part of a consideration. I think that's a good point that you raised because, um, you know, it's broader than just this one item in our in our budget. I, I mean, something that comes to mind. I know, I, I know we have surveyed a lot of things to death, and and that may not be the answer here, but it may be an interesting point, a data point for us to understand how many people. Would would change their mind on the busing based on fees. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm definitely not volunteering to word it, but or but it's just something that we should consider because trying to anticipate what parents would do differently is only based on five people's experience, and that's not that's not useful. I think information for all of you. Um, it's very it's very different for two working parents versus one working parent, you know, to to deal with bus situations and schedules and things. So I so I don't know how what the impact would be, but I, I just think that that may be something that we we look at in addition to it. I mean, I think I think the fee discussion is is difficult, but I think that we don't really have all the information behind it either. I think that's a longer term project than the FY17 budget, but I agree that it would be interesting to get that. I mean, because I, I just don't think that, I can't see that you're gonna eliminate fees this year. Um, are you? Oh, I, no, I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't think I, we were entertaining a discussion of eliminating the fees altogether, but I thought the question on the table was, are we going to do the 10% reduction yeah. for this is, year? I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. the question. Because okay. I don't even but think we know. a lot of other great thoughts have come <laughs> forward yeah. that we are gonna need to be thinking about and preparing for, um, because I think what I heard you say, John, is that the 40B housing is within less than two miles, so within I think, distance I think, I haven't measured it, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. And, yeah. Yeah. and you have to cross Main Street. I mean, yeah. it's not But it's we not know like, that those children are like not going to be able to walk, car, obviously, right. from that school uh, to Elmwood. Right. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things <clears> that we need to be thinking about going forward as, as the town, town continues to grow. Um, and ways that we can do this in a in an informed manner. What are the impacts going to be? How many people would make different choices? And um, what would it look like in terms of the numbers of kids that would be on buses? Um, I think the, this raises really great questions for us to explore over the next upcoming year. I think it also is, and, and this is obviously moving way outside of the discussion. But you know, we're we're having discussions about a bus parking lot on the new on the new um, school site. Um, <laughs> if we are moving in that direction, where there'd be a necessity for more buses, 
we need that information as well because you're not going to want to all of a sudden make that parking lot obsolete because mm -hmm. you can't fit enough buses there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, th there there are a lot of spider webs that come out of this discussion, but um, but certainly all very important questions and, and certainly have major budget impact in the coming years. Mm -hmm. so. And I don't think any of us were thinking no fees this year because I don't even know what that number is. <laughs> so. Well, it's like I've been saying for a long time, it's all about the busing. Right. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. have, I heard you say that, Ralph. Uh, <laughs> you haven't been around the office much, John. We have 3,400 students, right? Yeah. And how many of them ride the bus now? Probably 2,000. Okay, so that's, you know. That's your number. What is that? A third of kids are not riding the bus. That's a, that's a yeah. substantial swing. Mm -hmm. Because what your point is, is when there's no fee, you have to plan for every single one of those 3,400 right. kids has to have a seat, whether they it's a tipping point not. fee too, right? Yeah. There's the negligible. Yeah, the, the tipping point, the, the price of the bus pass really hasn't uh, had an impact on, on ridership. Oh, it hasn't? No, it hasn't. Um, the, the price of the late fee really had no impact on uh, people making sure they got their fee in on time. Um, you just for planning purposes. Yeah. Again, no fee, you have to issue 3,400 bus passes. Yeah. Right. Even if somebody never rides it. Yeah. It's just in like year seven, if you're down to 30% of it. Right. Does that, yeah, it might have to tip. And you, ha you know, it, it, it's not like the uh, airplanes where you bump people. You know, um, <laughs> thank you, Mike. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have to assume that they're all going to ride. <laughs> Yes. You can't <laughs> oversubscribe. <laughs> you can't oversubscribe the bus. I really can't imagine those phone calls like at all. <laughs> the <laughs> I mean, you need you would literally need an entire customer service department at that point. So I, yeah, I no. want to thank the school committee for appreciating that humor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh Lord. Must be at the end of the meeting. It is. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Ooh. so I think we have finished Everything up our else. budget presentations for the evening. Is that correct, Dr. McLeod? That is correct. And being that we were really trying hard to fill time to get everyone here because we were moving far too fast, we are done with the agenda um, for yeah. this evening. Our next meeting is a special meeting on the budget. Um, December 10th at 7 p.m. and we will be taking up elementary schools and the special education department that night. So we will therefore not be talking about foreign language. And capital. Aren't we doing and capital? Cap and we are doing and capital busing. as well. Oh, we're we did change it on the slide. <laughs> okay. Okay. Meaning Bob. <laughs> we're moving the capital <laughs> request prioritization to that meeting as well. Correct. Okay. Great. So thank you everybody and have a good we night. Have to vote to oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I knew there was something I was because I'm not staying here. I move to adjourn the meeting. Yeah. Second. All right, all those in favor of yes. adjourning? Yes. yes, yes. And it's unanimous. We are now adjourned at 9.